Hello and welcome to the Nash Tackle Off The Hook podcast. This week's guest, Ridge Monkey Hall of Famer, frontman and star of The Great Escape, Dan Hawks. But before Dan, some Nash news. Today's special guest, a man, now a man, 21, who's caught an absolute <laughs> epic common recently. All of £61, the major. Joe Ashton, welcome, mate. How are you? I'm um, good, thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you for coming down, mate. It's not a problem. You recovered yet? Not really. <laughs> <laughs> what a fish, mate. We're going to talk about the capture soon, but ironically, the guest for this week is Dan Hawkes. He's based in Kent. Yep. And you're a Kent boy. We've well, been down there fishing, haven't you? Yep. Um, I'll say I've not really known, I've not really known Dan that much. Uh, I've spoke to him on the phone and um, at like um, carp shows and everything like that. And he did text me when I caught the common, um, congratulating me and told me he was coming up today to do the podcast. And yeah, he's been smashing a stower up. Yeah. yeah. I was thinking about getting a ticket on there, but what? <laughs> my, tip, uh, my tip late ticket come up, so I had to... Where'd you go from that now? Mad. I've got a few places in mind, but... Good lad. Right, talk to me, because not every day somebody catches a £61 common in the UK. Talk to me through the capture, the lead up to it. Everything, mate. Well, I got my ticket in December. Um, I went for a rough patch, couldn't catch anything. Um, started getting amongst them and I realised they liked zigs on there. Caught a couple on zigs. Um, I said to Charlie, um, I'm going to start using zigs on there and I started having a few bites. When's this? What time of year is this, mate, again? um, This would be December, January time. Okay, so winter. Yeah, because nothing was coming out on the bottom so I thought, it's a bit strange. We were seeing them so, and it's, bearing in mind, tips only three, four foot deep. So I was using two foot zigs and stuff like that. And I started having bites. And then the word got out that I was having them off zigs and it just blew it. And then I went on a mad blanking spell again. I started getting amongst them. I can't remember, March time. I caught a, a 30 pound common. It's unreal. Like, what they call, I can't remember what they called it now. It was a really nice common. Um, but I was in like a, a run of small fish. I was catching everything in there. Commons, 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 everything. And like Char was saying to me, I'm going to catch the commons soon. You, you're wading through too many commons to not catch the big one. How like, many fish in there, mate? Give me an idea. Um, 70 or 80 fish in there, but it's known for mirrors. Yeah. And I was catching a load of 20 pound commons and I just couldn't catch a mirror. I think... I had one mirror out of like all the fish I caught. I've had one mirror, and I was, I was thinking, what am I doing wrong? And I just carried on. Really wanted. I joined the lake originally to catch some of them big dark, like mm. leathery mirrors. And my first fish out there was the scaliest one in there, <laughs> you know. And then I had a common. I braced a common with it. Um, yeah, I braced a little common, twenty pound common with, uh, with the scaly mirror. And after that, um, and these were off the bottom or still, still yeah, on the this, eggs? This was off the bottom. When I, my first two fish out there were caught out of the edge, right against the bank in December, uh, December the fourteenth. I caught two fish out of a swim. They called a day swim, really close, uh, and I was fishing right tight against my feet um, with handful of sweet corn and hemp, a bit of scope at squid flake, and I had two. Bite, so I was back leading straight off the front of my tips, had my rods right back. And yeah, I had two bites from doing that. Um, after that, the swim blew. Everyone started going in there, chucking bait everywhere, and it just, it Killed didn't, it. yeah, it, fish never come back there. And then they started moving around, the fish, they started to wake up a bit more. Then we started seeing them show, but nothing was coming out on the bottom. So that's when I went to the zigs. I was talking about using the zigs and stuff like that. I caught a couple on the zigs and then I think we went into the lockdown or something like that and then we had to stop um, night fishing. We had to just do days only and it was hard work because we was only finding a fish at night. Right, so they're only yeah. showing at night? Yeah, they was only showing at night. So we was like when we was doing days only, we was not 
we was not seeing nothing. We didn't we didn't know uh, we didn't know what was going on. Um, then we fa- I found him in a corner one time, and I used my Nash bushwhacker pole to get to him, and I caught a real like thirty two pound common. Most you wanted to like put his commons in there, and then I just after that I just started to learn the place a bit more. I I basically knew on the weather, learnt that place really quick. On the weather, I knew, like, if it was sunny, they'd be in the corners and up on the bars. Rain, there's no point fishing the place in the rain. Really? Don't fish terrible. in the rain? No, terrible. I've been up there a couple of times in the rain and haven't seen a fish, not had a bleep or anything like that. Wow. Um, so I knew I had to be up there when the sun was right and how can I put when the wind picked up on there because it's quite closed in the fish seem to um respond to it or not they some days they did some days they didn't they like to hang out on the back of the weed uh wind um and they like to um uh, show up in like corners but they'd be so spooky you'd You'd be casting on them, and I just knew it weren't the way forward. So I switched to like real little leads and uh, really, really long hook lengths. How long we're talking? Twenty-two inch hook lengths, right? Yeah, with what, any specific material. Um, the Nash Skin Link. I was using okay. the Nash Skin Link, and I was using um, like a little stiff hinge on it for real, real slow sinking baits. Um, and that started doing me bites because I was casting that fish when you couldn't get on it because of the weed. Um, it was really, really hard because the weed is so horrible in there. It's not Canadian. It's that slimy stuff. Mm. So no one ever knew if we was fishing properly and stuff like that. It was just, uh, I don't know how to put it. It was, you was blind fishing up there all the time because the spots are not really, not really that good in there because everyone uses bait boats on there. Yeah, you're getting spots that are tiny, and you're trying to fight, find and cast around them. You couldn't, you know. So that's why I switched to the real long hook lengths, and that did do me a lot of bites. Um, and then, like I said, once I switched to that, it started doing me a lot more bites. Like I was catching like twos, threes every time I was going. Right, and then, yeah. Leading up to like when I caught the common, it was just I started work and I couldn't get no time to go or anything like that. And I thought the lake was going to be really busy, like really, really busy. But when I turned up down there, there was um two, I think, or three. I was thinking, this is a bit strange. But it was obvious the England game was on. Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah so I thought, well, well, it's a... So I had a quick walk around. I thought, well, now I never usually get in the good swims or anything like that. You know, I've never fished the main swim, so all the main swims are free. And I thought, well, I'll have a quick walk around. I walked into one swim and it was black, this bay was full of them. It was quite hot. You know, the wind was trickling in there and I've just, I was watching them like cruise over a shallow area. And as I stood there, I was watching them. And I didn't make my mind up because I always had in my head, when I first got that ticket, I wanted to catch the common. Yeah. And you could always find that common, you know, it's, it's huge. Yeah. I've seen it in the edge. I've seen it on the bank a couple of times. I've seen it in the edge all the time. So I thought the ones I see out on the bars, we couldn't see anything real big at the time. And I thought, right, let's go and see if I can check up in the other corner where it likes to live. And I went up there. I didn't see nothing. So I come back, set up in that swim. And I just thought, right, I've got to tie everything new up. I weren't rushing because I didn't want to spook them or anything like that. Yeah. I had to wait for them to drift off. Managed to get a little uh, a little blowback rig out onto the bar. While I was setting up my other rod, I put another rod out on the a set of pads. And while I was uh, fishing on the pads, um, I was just literally sat down and I had a bite. And when I had a bite off one rod, I picked it up. It locked at me up down the back of the bar and I thought, um, I was like holding it for ages. I didn't gain nothing. And while I was holding my other, this, this rod, 
my other rod went, I've just dropped. <laughs> then I'll just like place, because I placed that one with a baiting spoon up uh, tight to the pad, because I knew it was like a nice clean area there. Right. And I placed that one, my other rod started to go. So I was in like a really big mess, you know, I had two rods. I've only just put my rods out. I was only 10, 15 minutes of having rods in the, well, two rods in the water, and I had two bites straight away. And while I was um, playing one, the other rod went, so I put that one down because it was locked me up on the back of the bar. Yeah. And then um, I picked the other rod up because I thought it was going to come out, but it went through the pads. And while I was standing, I could see it splashing about on the top of the pads, and I was thinking, I, it's, I need it to swim back out. Yeah. So I had to undo my bow alarm, let it swim back off, then shut my bow alarm back up, and then start pumping it towards me, and it, it come out of the pads. And I literally managed to net that one, and I thought, right, let me try and get this one up, hold this one. While that one's in there, I'll just pick this rod up, see if it's moved. Yes, yeah. yeah. And as I picked it up, it started to move. And I was thinking, oh, really? This this is crazy. <laughs> and I managed that one. I had a real, it was a really horrible battle, that one, because it kept trying to do me round into like a, it's a back channel. It kept trying to go up the back of there. Right. And I could hear it splashing. I couldn't see it, but I could hear it splashing around, like, behind me. And I stood there for ages and also I managed it it come up the reed line. And also it just come in on the top. And I managed to net that and I had two twenty pound commons. And so I was over the moon. I thought, right, England's playing, I wanna sit down now, get the rods out, sit down, have some food and watch the England game. So that's what I did. Um Well, that's what I was hoping to do. <laughs> I photographed um the two commons, I put them back and I just managed to put two rods back out and I was tying another rig up and out the corner of my eye I see a fish show and as I looked I watched it bubble all the way back down towards this spot I knew was clean so and I, it fizzed so I went, um, didn't bother with the rig I chucked the rig on the thing it just picked my rod up and cast into the area and I got a real good drop and I put it in the clear wound it back and it was clean and I was like, right, that's where that rod's going, because I didn't know what to do with this other rod. Right. Because I hadn't seen nothing in that area. I just wanted to put the rods where the fish were. And I hadn't seen nothing in that area, so I thought to myself, right, that's where that's... I've made my mind up now. Yeah, job done. It's going in there. I put my little uh, blowback rig on with two 12 mil bottom baits. I cast it out, missed it three or four times. I was thinking, I've just hit it first time. Mm. And all of a sudden, I cast once, and it... The drop I got on it, I couldn't tell you. It was so hard. Yeah. And I knew how many sections it was on the baiting pole to bait up to it. So I didn't have to, like, sp- uh, spawn, catapult. I didn't want to do none of that. So I just uh, got my baiting pole out, tipped, like, my particle and that, my hemp, <coughs> my hemp and stuff like that in, um, yeah, in the spoon. Yeah. yeah. And some little bit of crumb and stuff like that. Put it out. I've mostly done three or four like like bait um, spoonfuls. Sat down. I thought, right, I'm going to put some food on, have some dinner, and watch the football and chill out. And within twenty minutes, ten minutes, I received like a real. It was a strange bite. It pulled up tight, really tight. And I was sitting there. I was thinking, because it's really shallow. I was thinking, are they picked me up? coming through like, mm. like a real big liner and also it pulled out my clip so I picked the rod up I didn't know and it just kited and I was really weird it felt really heavy and it went round the back of a set of pads and locked me up in a bit of weed but it only locked me up 10 seconds and all of a sudden it come out and as it come towards me it went round to my left into another set of pads but it actually went in these ones and I was standing there with the rod couldn't see enough. I could see the pads moving, the vortex is coming up. And I was thinking to myself, why is, why is it vortex has come up? That's quite deep, that little bit there. <laughs> and also, as I pulled my rod, I see the head come out of the common. It come up between the pads. Oh. It was caught around the pad. And I stopped. I was like, oh, my God, that's the common. That's the big one. That's horrible knowing you've got it. Yeah, and I, I was thinking, right, what do I do? And I could see my line lassoed like round a pad stem. Oh. I was thinking, right, this is this is not good. This is not good. And I remember because the tip they have um like green garden chairs at the back of the swims like for like. 
guest chairs and stuff like that. Okay. And I chucked the one, I had one at the front of the swim, but I chucked it up the back of the swim and I thought, I need to go and get that chair. So I undone my clutch, put the rod on the floor, had to run back to the back of the swim, pick the chair up, run back, hoping it was still on there. Knowing you've got the bigger. Yeah. And I put the chair down on the floor, picked the rod back up and within a couple of head shakes, I see the pad root snap and I was... I was in contact with it then, but he kept trying to keep going back there. But what was going through my head, I could, I knew it was it. You know, and I, was, I just, it was just like I was shaking. Yeah. And that common fight's really weird. Well, it did with me anyway. It was like every time I got it close, it was like really upside down and like headbutt in the bottom. And its tail was splashing about on the surface. Well, like just burying its head down into yeah. it, like it's trying to get rid of the urkel, yeah. shake it. That's crazy. I don't, I've done I've never seen it in my life. It was like it come towards me and all of a sudden it, it would turn up like virtually up and then just swim down and headbutt the, the bottom. And I was thinking, that's what's going on here. Yeah. And, it, and all of a sudden it just come up. And as it come up towards me, I just managed to put the net underneath it. As it was coming towards me, I put the net under it. And I could feel its belly coming along the front of my cold. You know, and I was thinking, this is huge, this yeah. is huge. And as I went to like, I went to pick the net up, and it was still half hanging out. And I was shaking with the net. When it like flipped over, I just remember looking, standing up on, like, standing up, lifting the net up, looking down and thinking, mate, I need to sit down because otherwise I'm going to pass out. <laughs> it's that big, you know. And I was thinking, I can't, hang on. And I just managed to, I remember sitting down, on like sitting down on my like, on the floor next to the net, ringing my dad and saying, "Dad, I've got the big one." And he went, "Don't lie." I said, "No, Dad, I promise you, I've got the big one." He went, "Joe, stop lying." I said, "I'm not." He went, "All right, I'm on my way down." And I remember ringing Charlie Bong saying, "Like, can you um, FaceTime me?" I said, "Char." He told me, "He went, you can't, you're gonna ca- catch it soon." He texted me. <laughs> he texted me saying. Just before I caught it, that big one's not too far. When I sent him a photo of I had two in the net at the same time. Yeah, yeah. He sent me that big one's not going to be far. And I, I just remember FaceTiming him and he was like, no way. And, um, yeah, he, he, I rang my dad to wait till everyone come down and everything. Charlie left his girlfriend at his mum's house just to come <laughs> and see the, see the fish. <laughs> Priorities, Charlie. Charlie's just in the back of the studio here laughing his head off. That's quality. Yeah, he rang me. He said, Joe, don't get rid of it. Don't let that go. I'm on my way down. My days. I'm, du- um, I'm leaving my girlfriend at my mum's house. I'm on my way down. And he come down and a few of the other boys come round. My dad turned up and I just, I let everyone else get on with the weigh in, zero in. I didn't have nothing to do with it. And when they read the scales, I was, I was blown away. I couldn't. Oh. And, what a fish it was, you know. I mean, picking up for the photos is an epic feat in itself, mate. Yeah, it was with a fish that size, and I'm not exactly the biggest people, you know, and I was picking it up. It's just so top heavy. and Yeah. You got cr- some cracking photos, though, mate, in yeah. the water. We'll overlay them, obviously, on this. Yeah. But a six, like the 60-pound common in the UK, that is an elite club of anglers, mate. Yeah. Like I say, I, I was so blown away and I was, I had, I was, ple- uh, how can I put it? I was pleased I had a good bunch of boys around to me to share the moment with me yeah. because, well, when I actually landed it, I had no one around me. I had landed it all on my own and everything like that. And I was just looking at the net thinking, how am I going to, how am I going to lift that? <sighs> but yeah, I had a real good bunch of boys to come around and do the photos and after that, I wound in, went round into the little lodge and watched the football. Yeah. And yeah, we just, I packed up and we packed up in the morning, went home and. What a fish, mate. What a moment. And it is literally the fish of a lifetime, mate. Yeah. And then subsequently, obviously England did all right to a a point. And then you had your 21st birthday on Saturday, didn't you? Yeah. Yeah. What a week that is. I know, it's been mad. Sunk in or not? No, not really. I don't think it will for a while, no. mate, but you've got some great photos. Any video footage or anything like that of it? Um, yeah, we have got a bit of video footage. Oh, nice. Yeah. But memory-wise, incredible, mate, yeah. and a top, top, top bit of angling. I've certainly got 
Well, near, but nowhere really near to a 60, 61 pound on the dot, wasn't it? Yeah, 61 Common. pound on the dot. Where to now? You've got some targets, you said. Um, I still want to stay on the tip because I want to catch a couple of the big mirrors out of there. Right. There's still a few mirrors in there I'd like to catch, but I think next year I've got, um, I might go Averley. Okay. Watch out. We might be seeing a little bit more of you on the podcast, mate, if things go to plan. Yeah. But a massive thank you for coming in, mate. Yeah, brilliant, brilliant me. capture, mate. Incredibly impressive at such a young age, mate. And all the best in your future angling. I'm going to go and get out a slightly older version of yourself, Mr. Hawks. He's going to kill me for saying that. <laughs> but he hasn't caught the £60 yet, but I think it's on his radar. Big love, mate. Thank you for coming in, Joe. Thank you for having me, Hassan. Dan Hawks, welcome to the Nash Off The Hook podcast. How are you? Very good, thank you. Thank you for having me. No, oh, thank you for coming in, mate. You've even bought biscuits. Biscuits and cider. You can come in every week. <laughs> How have you been, man? What have you been up to recently? Uh, so, I've literally not long come out of quarantine because, uh, very fortunate, got across to France, done a little session over there with Paul, my boss, but it was actually a holiday, but we both decided to go together, spend a week's holiday together and do a bit of fishing. But with that, you do have to quarantine. Yeah. Uh, Oriana, last six weeks has been really manic I've been to Oriana quarantine been to Spain, uh, France quarantine and then back on shop visits going mm. around fitting racking day to day job looking after the shops and squeezing in a couple of overnighters here and there but anyone that knows me I tell you you, like, you know me <laughs> relatively well a million miles an hour don't sit still and and yeah, you don't just, do things by halves either mate family busy work schedule plus everything else that comes with the ship bridge monkey at the moment in terms of filming, mate. Yeah, uh, I feel blessed as an individual because to get the opportunity to do what I do on a day-to-day basis, I love sales, I like talking to people, I like going into fish and tackle shops, I like driving around the country, which a lot of the sales people don't actually like doing, mm. but I don't really mind it. When I go on the European trips to Europe, some of the journeys are 27, 28 hours. So it's just day-to-day life. And when you do a job in the industry... You've got to go full bore. You can't go half-hearted, but you have to have a balance between family life and work life. And it is testing. Mm. I won't say to anyone it's not testing, but you get massive rewards, you know? Like I'm working in the industry for one of the biggest companies. I feel blessed every day. Sometimes I don't even class it as a job because it's enjoyable. And See, so right, and that's how exactly you want to feel. We're going to pick up, I think, there is a good place to start. So you as an individual, obviously you're at Ridge Monkey now, sales manager. Yeah, really? uh, UK sales manager. UK <laughs> sales manager. Um, but in terms of your journey in the industry, how did it begin in terms of getting into the industry, your profession? So I've always been quite a keen, keen angler from a young age. Uh, my granddad used to take me to Hive Canal when I was very, very small and some of the gravel pits at Lid. So uh, my granddad was there for me. Uh, me idol, done everything that someone should have done as a guardian. My mum was amazing, but she was concentrating, taking me to football when my granddad stepped up and done the dad things. Took yeah. me fishing, outdoors, and I just absolutely loved it. But my football really took off and I was playing football at quite a good level for quite a chunk of my teenage years up to 18, 19, 20. What sort of level? What are we talking? Uh, well, I, wouldn't, I wasn't getting paid, right? but I was playing at quite good levels, county football, and I'm actually gone back to playing county football now. So... 34 years old, playing county football. Hey, should have uh, got on the England team, mate. Could have done no, with you. N- n- <laughs> never that good. Uh, credit to them as well, what they achieved. Oh, great. mega. So, yeah, I touched on, uh, been fishing with my granddad. Just little things, fishing the canal. No carp involved. It was all roach, rud, skimmers. Just getting a feel for it. He liked fishing. He was based at the army base down at Lyd. And when he was, uh, there was three times at the weekend, he'd take me fishing, take me to football to watch Tottenham, big Tottenham fan. So my childhood was that. Then football was a big key part of it. But then I got a job at the Channel Tunnel. I worked at the railway there. Right. And well, I think I was 19 at the time. I worked there for quite a few years, but it was shift work. And I hadn't really got to grips with it too well. I'd worked there for quite a while. I was doing night work. The, my partner now is my wife, Emma. Mm. She had a baby. Uh, my son, Joseph, or we had a baby, my son, Joseph, uh, and the job at the tunnel was quite stressful having a newborn. So I was doing 
shifts that was 11 o'clock at night through mm. to 7 o'clock in the morning or 7 o'clock in the morning through to 3 in the afternoon or 3 to 11. And it was never no given pattern, working yeah. weekends. The money was okay for that sort of age that I was. But How old were you? N- ni- 19. 19. Working there uh, with quite a few good mates, good laughs. But I did it for three, four years. No, I did it for... I started there when I was at 17 and a half in a different role. And then I moved on to a uh, lot of platform supervisors and yeah. being involved with uh, the Euro Tunnel. There's a lot of chocking. There's loads of different like departments and areas you could be at. And some of my mates are still there now, God bless them, and they love it. It's just like a real... Sim- and they've worked there since I've worked there. Yeah. They've just never had a different uh, path in life and just decided to stay. But when I was there and my wife could see it was really getting stressful, I was doing night shifts. My son would be crying in the morning as babies do and I'd get up and it's really hard to get in sort of shift pattern life. Mm. When I had a newborn, it wasn't too hard when I didn't have a son. And then my wife came home one day and said, I know how much you love fishing. Because I, I basically, I skipped going from catching small fish to carp. To carp. I, I did sort of have a big jump. So I didn't really develop as an angler. I just went fishing with my granddad, catching small fish skimmers. And then when I was at the channel, no, I was at Peugeot. I was working at Peugeot. I did a panel beating apprenticeship when I was sick. Before? Before, before I worked at Channel Tunnel. So I'll go back slightly. I did a panel beating apprenticeship. And one of the people there, Stuart, said, oh, uh, we're having a little bit of a group bonding. Some of the lads are going camping and going to go fishing. Do you want to come along? And it was carp fishing. So I borrowed some gear. And it was, it was the bollocks, to put it bluntly. <laughs> I thought, this is pucker. This is like really, really good. So I got back into it slightly, bought a little bit of gear. I was only going to Radnor Park, Hive Canal again, trying to catch the carp. Cottonton Lakes on the smaller ponds. And I really, really did enjoy it. And then there was a little period where I got a ticket from by the Channel Tunnel. There's a little lake, St. Paul's Anglin, two little ponds there, Beechborough Park. You've got one lake that had a £27 common in and the other lake had a £32 grassy, I believe, but like back then. And I caught both of them pretty quick. Yeah? Really, really quickly. So... I know it's not a young age to have like a twenty good twenty pounder, but for me then it's sort of yeah this is good you know I could get a I quite like this so I put the football on the back burner a bit and got a bit of money together and bought a carp set up Shimano five thousand uh, yeah. little bait runner STs some rods which weren't the greatest at the time I think believe they are badger carp and there's a great story on this as well because Go on badger carp yeah I remember that we're, we're, this is a <laughs> brilliant so. Uh, I got to the age where you get to that age, 16, 17, that sort of time when boys meet girls, people get cars, and there was a little place, a little journey out in Kent, Pluckley. It's one of the most haunted places in Kent. One of the most haunted places in England, Pluckley. Pluckley? So there's a place there called Pluckley Brickyard, which you weren't allowed to fish, but you'd catch them in there all day and night on bread on the top. Like, people would go there to take a bird to have a little bit of a kiss and a smooch. But I went there with three lads and we were just fishing. It was, like, <laughs> really cool. I thought you were going to say three lads for a kiss three and Three lads smooch, smooching. <laughs> but where you were fishing, you weren't allowed in there because it was asbestos city. Ooh. It was so dangerous. So we didn't go into... It was, like, an old industrial unit uh, all in the roof of bad asbestos. So we didn't go in there. But it was just awesome to be fishing. So we go there have a beer. And one of my lifelong buddies, Gary, he ain't a carp angler. And... He had my brand new reels, my brand new rod. He had one and I had one. And I was always fishing off the top for bread. And I, I was holding mine, waiting for the rod to go. He put his on the floor. Never done the bait runner. My brand new rod and reel, zzzz, in the lake. No. So a fortnight after getting my first, here we go, a little bit of a setup. Yeah, I'm sorted. One of my good mates lost one in the pond. Did he, get you, did he sort you out? Did no, he... I did he bollocks here. Yeah. <laughs> <Did he? laughs> yeah, no, he didn't. And uh, so, yeah, so my first sort of rod and reel combos, which weren't amazing, ended up in Plutley Brickyard. And safe to say, we never got it, never got it back. That's a piece of carp fishing history. If somebody goes down the brickyard, oh, someone goes down now, oh, yeah. I think it's been filled in now. It's a bit <laughs> derelict. And but from that, when I worked at the Channel Tunnel, my wife, uh, she could see it was like really getting to me, mm. and the. Just the longevity of getting up, not knowing your shift work. Like there was never no structure to it, so you didn't know how long I'd be on nights for four days at a time, five, threes, twos, then going one day off into days. Yeah, there's no time to get any sort of balance. And my wife said, "Oh, there's a fishing tackle sort of emporium, new tackle shop opening up in Canterbury." Emporium, yeah, like a bit, yeah, like it was, uh, and and it was fat fish tackle. So at the time, Andy 
uh, put these adverts out. Is that Andy the owner? Andy Reynolds of Flatfish, yeah, yeah. lovely gentleman, and I, I know him a lot in this trade. Lovely gentleman, and uh, my wife said, "I'm going to apply for you to go and work there. It's similar money, but you might be able to get a job in the fishing." And I was like, "I thought my knowledge on fishing was relatively okay. Like I'd gone to smaller venues and caught okay, yeah, but." I'm like a sponge. I always want to absorb knowledge. I always want to learn. And going to work in a tackle shop, it was a bit of a catch-22 at first because I actually went there, had the interview of Andy, and I'd done a little bit of fishing other places, uh, Cottington, and I'd caught fish to 27, 28 pound and a 32 pound grassy. So it's not like a huge CV. And I was quite daunted and nervous that I'm going to be going work in a tackle shop. Some of these people that are going to come in I'm going to learn loads off these, mm. but I don't want to sound like a prick because I don't know the levels that they know. <laughs> yeah. And it was new to me. And when I went in there, Andy went, mate, I, I love you. He said, you're like, I'm I, I, I bouncing off you straight away. Uh, I can see you're quite a lovely chatty person and I go away, have, have a little think. I'm going, to offer, I'm going to offer you a position at the shop. So I was left to go back, work back at the tunnel. Two weeks passed. I had to give Andy the decision that I was going to give up my job at the tunnel and go and work there, which I decided to do. And I started at the shop and there was myself, a lad called Alan, and Andy at the time had no shop managers. There was no shop managers. It was just Andy, the owner, myself, Alan, and Alfie. Alfie, uh, Good old who, who, yeah, who works for you boys, he was the junior who was going to come in at the weekends, do the odd Saturdays. Mum and dad would drop him off because he was still a young lad then. Yeah. Uh, but he became an integral part of what we achieved in a very short period of time at Fatfish. We turned... An area, the shop was a old carpentry unit. When I turned up from the interview, ankle deep in sawdust, mezzanine up top, like all workman's materials and equipment. But Andy had a vision and I knew from that interview, the way that he spoke and the conviction of what he told me, I knew it would be a success because of his vision. And I thought to myself, when I left there, I thought, he's got drive, he's got vision, he's got he's got ambition, this fella. i, I yeah, I could learn a lot of this gentleman, mm. and I did. And I learned a lot about myself. I learned a lot about him. I learned a lot about business. I learned a lot about the trade. I learned a lot about the whole fishing industry. And he's very, very good friends with Danny Fairbrass, so I got to know the guys at Corder really well. Uh, over my time at the shop, I got to know Alan and Kevin quite well from you here for coming to do the trade shows. And the shop was just, it was a breath, breath of fresh air for that area. That area of Canterbury is the mecca in Kent for carp yeah. fishing. You've yeah, got, yeah. at the time, eight, nine lakes around the area that have got 40 pounders in, but no real suitable tackle shop. And he had the vision, 3,000 square feet, I'm going to turn this into a superstore, and he did. And, and he did it by his hard work, his dream, his beliefs, his passion, but then his passion and beliefs turned into my passion and beliefs, mm. Alfie's passion and beliefs, the other lads have passion and beliefs. And he had that sort of aura about him where he wouldn't stand for any nonsense. He wouldn't stand for any shit. He had a level of expectation. If he didn't have a level of expectation, unfortunately, he probably would have got released or gone. But we all loved the buzz, the customers coming in. And over my time at the shop, I worked there for a good few years. I think I worked there for three and a half years. And after six months, Andy actually made me a store manager. So... I had quite a lot of responsibility. I was locking up the shop. I was doing the alarm systems. I was on call if we had a, ever had a break in, and we actually had one uh, a break in. A break in, but they didn't get in. They didn't get a lot of stuff. Right. The alarm system did what it had to do, and I was there, and the police was there, and the uh, the owner of the actual unit they arrived as well. So it served its purpose. But that tackle shop was a big step in for me in life development because until that point, I'd always worked on the railway. I'd been a grafter. Mm. From leaving school, I'd been a grafter, tried me hand at panel beating, another opportunity came up, building roof trusses for one of my pals, so I went and worked doing some roof trussing. Yeah. Another opportunity came up to go and work on the railway, so I took that and I seized it with both hands. And I was very nervous to go and work in the shop, as I said, because you've got some very good anglers in Kent, some historical anglers in Kent that have achieved so much in their angling that have gone on to catch British record fish from Kent and they're going to be customers that are coming in the shop so I knew I had to be sharp I had to not talk the talk but I had to be opinionated and not just think that what I've learned in a short period of time is to be all and end all mm. because everyone's got an opinion whether everyone likes it or not 
you got to listen to people. When people are telling you advice, whether it be rigs, watercraft, sales, uh, involvement with money, cash flow, I try and turn my hand to be the best of what I can do with in whatever I put my hand to. Mm. And I felt in the short period that, I say short period, three and a half years of running that tackle shop for Andy, I believe I was a good servant for him and I believe I helped make it the success that it is now. And that wasn't just through me, it was through Alfie, it was through Mark, another lad who came in, and the staff that he's now got there now. It's easy to uh, build a reputation and get to the top. Once you're at the top, if you get complacent, it's very easy and fast to come back down. You know, And that's what Andy sort of built into us. We want to work to be up there with the likes of the Tackle Boxes, the Johnson Rosses, the Yateleys at the time, where... They were the superstores. They had a mecca's of fishing shops. They yeah. had they had brochures and catalogues, three hundred pages like long, like a like an old Littlewoods yeah, catalogue for fishing quality, for fishing yeah. equipment. <laughs> yeah. You know, and they were the mecca. And if we could be a percentage of what they was doing right, we had excelled for that area, and that's what we wanted to do. And we we achieved it. And I know the lads are achieving it now. And it's an incredible shop. And I've gone on to nice things, progressed in the trade, and so's Alfie. And I, and I don't doubt that it's one of those shops that. Other staff members in there could progress because of yeah. Andy's business leadership, his aura, the way that he's very business minded, but he cares about his staff and he wants, he does want them to succeed and he wants them to achieve things in life, you know, and he's got his own family that are all doing very well. He's very comfortable and I've moved on to think about my family and progress in my life. Yeah. But it was a great start to my life journey because until that point I'd never done sales, Hassan, and Everyone tells me that I'm relatively good at sales. Yeah. Like sales is a confident thing, but you've got to be a people person. You can't neglect things. You can't neglect returns. You can't neglect issues. You can't neglect shops. And I genuinely, I, you know, before I worked for a, a big retailer and I think every single tackle shop that I've been in subsequently and the tackle shops I spoke to even the time when I was there, they they all said in terms of sales people, in terms of sort of, that prefer professional but also personal relationship with them, they all they all rated you, mate. So it, that is testament to your work because you can't really f- fake that. It's quite an, an, an honest conversation they're having with somebody who's not involved yeah. with you and they're telling me that. So that is testament. But a lot of that is down to your communication. And as you said there, you, you've learnt that in a way through going in the tackle shop, different anglers coming in and having to adjust how you speak. But you must have some affinity, like gift of the gab from day one, because you can't, there's some people that can be in that environment, but wouldn't take it on in that regard. My mum always says that I got that from my nan and granddad, because when they uh, lived on the marsh, when my granddad came out of the army, they ran a charity shop. It sounds like quite bad, but without charity shops... There's a lot of people that are not going to get nothing in life, you know. We all take things for granted day to day. And for the people that donate and give to other people, they're making a lot of people's lives change. And my nan was always someone, she didn't realise until she passed away, bless her, that she, my nan had a lot of money. My nan didn't have, well, she, she had money. Yeah. But she would never spend money. She would always accumulate it. Yeah. And her and my granddad wouldn't have any luxuries, any royalties. And when I was growing up, uh, apart from going to watch Tottenham, that was my like my main true love. My royalties were football and Tottenham. Yeah. So I didn't really have loads as a child growing up. I didn't have lots of... I had nice things, but it was a case of when I had nice things, I looked after them and I made them last like longevity because I wouldn't know when I'd get the next one. Yeah. So, uh, and my nan and granddad, they used to have a shop in Rye uh, by Canberra Sands and the sole purpose of having that shop was everything they sold they gave all the money to the donkey sanctuary in Dorset to give to charity. And when my nan passed away, a big chunk of her uh, sort of life savings, she gave to charity. And that was the people they were. But they were very good at selling, but they didn't sell to benefit themselves. No. They sold to benefit charities. And my mum just thinks that because I was around them at like League Club days, there used to be an event, League Club Day, and I'd always go there help out and bag things up when they're selling like bric-a-brac pieces of porcelain that you <laughs> yeah, you yeah. see in like somewhere in Spain, a terracotta place, you know, <laughs> like, which isn't amazing stuff, but they'd sell it for 50p and it'd all go to charity and I'd bag it up and I'd be learning off them. So my mum believes that I've got the patter and that off them. But I think being in and around people and the biggest factor I can say, which has helped me in sales for Sonic, because I worked for Sonic Sports previous to Ridge Monkey, which I touch on, is I've been now both sides of the counter. Yeah. When I worked at Fat Fish, 
I saw the representatives from brands who used to come in and see me and the ones that sort of, in a way, had an aura about them as well where they would come in and they would service a shop how the shop would want to be serviced. There was some that would, I won't name names because it's just not fair to do that. There was some that would come in and they would basically, I'd be busy with customers or Andy would, they'd go over to their racking area display and they'd already write down the items that are missing, which I think is quite rude to do. Uh, and so did Andy. And he's like, anyone who does that, they won't have an order. Mm. You know, we, we will tell them what we want and we phone up. And because, but the other thing, mate, like when you shop appointments, they're very important. You need to make shop appointments. And that's like a time slot. You go there to talk about your brand and your brand only, not worry about what other people are doing. And that's what yeah. I don't do. I like genuinely, I'm here today. Uh, filming a podcast for Nash and I feel privileged to do it because I sort of work for a competitor. Well, there's no bad blood between anyone as brands, but yeah. uh, when you've got them time slots and allocation in the shops, the staff's time is really important. They've got their own things to worry about. They've got their sales on eBay, Amazon, footfall coming through the door. You might have someone on a maggot run delivering live baits. So their time's important. They don't need me going in there talking about what a salesperson from someone else is doing or how's this selling. Mm. I concentrate solely on what we're doing. Yeah. You can only worry about yourself. You can't worry about what others are doing. So-and-so smashing it, mate. Good luck to them. Fair play. Do you know but what? I think that's the mark of somebody successful as well. I see it a lot. And as again, I'm not going to name names, but I see a lot of people who sort of deflect from what they're doing by thinking about other people or belittling other people or other brands or whatever it may be. You can't. Everybody who's successful does. You can't. You can only think about yourself. You're successful Take if care you've got... Driven, if you're if you're driven, you're enthusiastic. That helps massively, you know. Mm. Don't get me wrong. If you're selling something that you actually believe in, selling it is very easy. Yeah. Backed up with marketing from a strong brand, products sell. If you've got enthusiasm, beliefs, and marketing, products will sell. But uh, I go back a little bit. Like with, with regards to the reps that come in, there were some that just had it. Like I don't think appear, appearance isn't everything. But if you go in smart, sharp, polite notepad, tablet, you actually worry and you become friends with the shop staff. So we had reps that were coming that become friends with me. So I saw the ones that were doing it right and the ones that I believed were doing certain things wrong. So when I had the opportunity to leave Sonic, I did a show for Fatfish Tackle. I did a lot of shows for Fatfish and I did a show uh, in conjunction with Sonic Sports. And lo and behold, after the show, one of the salespeople who was there, Paul, he left and bought a fishery in France. So Ian McCormack, who was at Sonic, came up to me and said, Dan... Uh, what you've sold at this show is actually phenomenal. Mm. And it wasn't my first taste of shows because I did Carp Zwaller with Europe, with Corda, Corda Europe. When I, worked, when I worked at Fatfish, I did it with Andy. Me and Andy went out, helped Danny, and I was on a stand with Daryl. And Corda Europe sell, uh, at the time they was doing like Signet, a main line. That's oh, like, okay. a, like a bit yeah. of a portfolio out there. And I was on the Signet stand with Corda and, and Daryl. And Daryl said it back then. He's like, Daryl Peck this is, and, and, and to be fair, uh, genuinely lovely fella. Yeah. And you could only learn off him. So when he spoke about fishing, my ears pricked up because I wanted to learn. He's pretty and he, and, and he was like, all the way back then, doing the same with me with sales. He was like, fucking hell, this, this kid's actually, this kid is on fire. Yeah. This kid is selling loads of gear. And these are foreigners. That's a they, big show as well. Yeah, and, and they're foreigners. And I quick, I speak quite quick, but when, again, I adapted they were talking to me, so I was slowing down, slowing down the pace, talking nice and slow, nice and quieter, instead of going off on a tangent. Mm. And I was selling lots of gear. And I just think that when I do them shows, I put everything into it, you become friends with the customers. You don't just take money off someone and run. You know, you want to you have a sort of be friendly. You want to sell stuff. You're there to sell. Mm. But you don't want to pull the wool over people's eyes, you know. It's very easy to sell something they could have issues with it. I like to, when I'm selling something at a show, I like to go for everything. If there's do's and don'ts, I go for the do's and the don'ts. Sometimes the don'ts, don'ts could outweigh, someone might not buy it. But you want to be honest with these people because you don't want them on a Monday morning ringing up the company and saying, so-and-so understand, sold me this. They never told me about this. So I like to try and get everything across so it eliminates returns, it eliminates the problems. Yeah. But this is a process I've built up over time for doing sales. You don't want returns. If someone's got a return, that person's unhappy because they can't use a product for a short space of time. It might be a long space of time. So they get a replacement or a credit. And I don't want that. I want people to go away happy, smile on their face, love this product, talk about it. 
whether out of that being at Fatfish, Corder, when I did the show for Corder, and when I was at Sonic. And I did the show with Sonic, and Ian McCormack says, man, this, like, again, this, this, this lad can sell. I'd like to offer you a position. Sat down in the evening. Uh, what would your thoughts be? And it was a daunting, it was very daunting, mate. So I'd have been, I was offered the chance to be the regional sales manager for Sonic Sports, selling rods, reels, uh, some luggage. And at the time that I joined them, they were just going into a bit of higher end pricing, XTI at the time, okay. uh, and Gravity Rods in conjunction oh, yeah. with Frank Warwick, Gravity X's. So it was a good opportunity to go away from a shop where the difficulty was with it, and this is the big thing to outweigh, loved working for Andy, loved the whole community in Canterbury because that's where I've learned. Because when I was at Fatfish, I, I cut my teeth on all the lakes around there, sort of dipped my toe in all of them to learn off the anglers that were fishing there and the big fish that resided in them lakes. And I'll touch on some fish locally in a little while. But when he offered me this job opportunity, so I had to weigh it up. Fatfish tackles, 10 minutes from my house. mm I'd gone from working at the Channel Tunnel, doing all these different hours. Family work balance was sort of on the sway. But now I'm running a shop, Monday to Friday, the odd Saturday, 10 minutes from home. Got lakes on my doorstep, fishing one, two nights a week. The wife's happy, I'm happy. Great balance. Yeah. Or I can go and be a regional sales manager and cover from Bournemouth to Norwich. (laughs) Yeah. Which is a bit daunting. And I'd only ever sold in the shop. So now I was going to be one of the representatives who was – that side of the counter now selling to who I was. So, and it, it, it and it, it's a big, I wouldn't say it's a transformation. You, you learn to adapt. Mm. And I spoke to Andy and his business, as I understood his business, I was like, where can I progress in the shop? What can I do? Anything going to change in the near future? We can have another shop and maybe you could look after one, I'll look after the other. What, what's the plans is because I've been offered this job opportunity. And to be fair, Andy weighed up both sides for me. He went, Dan, you're going to be away a lot, staying in hotels, servicing shops. You're going to be away from the wife again. Uh, and it is, it's, a different, it's a different challenge. It's a different beast. Yeah. I'm now going to be a shop manager. I'm going to go from a shop manager to selling to shop managers and shop owners. And I know that some people that had come in our shop had ruffled our feathers. Mm. I don't want to go in and ruffle anyone else's feathers. Bit the bullet, decided to do it with my wife's backing. Some very close friend of mine, got a great mate, Mark Terry, lovely gentleman. Like he's my daughter's godparent, and he's got his own business. And he went, Dan, I'm just going to tell you this, mate. Whatever you put your name to, you will achieve. Mm-hmm. Because one, you're a people person. You don't bullshit people. You tell people how it is. If you don't know the answer to something, this is something I learned as well. If you don't know the answer to something, you don't lie. You don't bullshit. Yeah. If you don't know the answer to something very sorry, give me two minutes, I will phone someone who does know the correct answer and I'll phone you straight back. You can't blag people. The industry, everyone believes, is very large, but it's very small. (laughs) And a lot of people have worked for a lot of brands, a lot of companies, and I've never wanted to do that. I wanted to sort of get my feet in somewhere and work my way as far as I can possibly in that company. Decided to take this job for Sonic after the advice of a very good mate, Mark, and it was daunting. Sonic were based in Blythe, Northumberland, so up Newcastle way. Yeah. So any meetings at head office, it's a long way from Canterbury to Blythe. And I'd be looking after a large proportion of some great shops in England, which uh, I did. And I loved my time at Sonic. Met some great people, Frank Warwick and obviously Ian who's there. And met some great shops and made great relationships. But the biggest thing I ever did, and I've still got it now, and it is a great factor for me. If anyone's looking to get into the industry, to get in with sales, you've got to be enthusiastic, enthusiastic have loads of energy, enthusiasm. If you've got a family, it can be hard. So I'm not going to lie, bullshit anyone. It can be really difficult. Yeah, I bet. But you have to find a happy medium. What I did was I decided to get a black book. So I've got a black notebook, A to Z. I wrote down every shop that was in my area. And you can't look after every shop and you can't give shop. You basically, I find now I I neglect some shops and I hate that. I hate the fact that because of how busy I am with racking displays, great escapes, filming, product filming, you do neglect shops. So there's shops that I haven't seen in quite a while and I try and work out my call plans when I'm available. It's been hard because of COVID and quarantine, so it's made it even harder. But I, I never like to neglect the shops because if you neglect them and you're not showing them stuff, you're losing traction in that shop for the people that are going in there 
and showing them something. And you might have a metre of space, you might have six metres of space. Next visit, you might have three metres of space. And they can say, Dan, you ain't been here for three months and blah, 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 I haven't seen this, I haven't seen that. So I hate the fact I neglect. And it is a, it's a horrible thing to do because I value every business, whether they spend, it's crazy, but it's true. I value every business, whether they spend a million pound or a thousand pound a year annual turnover. Because how do you know that that person might get silent investment or silent back in? Mm. And they might end up having three, four, five shops. You just don't know. Yeah. So you've got to value everyone. You've got to give everyone the same integrity, the same respect, the same time. And it is very hard when you've got lots of shops, lots of commitment to do that. And neglect ne- neglect does come in, and I don't like it. But So when I, when I divided, decided to go from the shop to the trade side of selling to the shops, I got myself a black book. And this has really helped me. So I'd have like, A, hey, Alan, A hey, and R Tackle, lovely shop. I know, obviously, his name. I wrote down. I'd have his name, the address of the shop, contact number, email, fax number. Some of faxes, I probably don't now. Uh, but I would get his wife's name. He's got two kids, boy or girl. What do they do? What hobbies do they do? I try and find out as much information. Yeah, and I know that information. Stick it in your black book. So I know when I phone him up. Yeah. When I phone him up, and he say to me, "All right, Dan, how are you? How's the family?" Over memory, over time. Yeah, I'm fine, mate. Oh, how are the dogs? I know he's got a French bulldog. How's your little one? Oh, yeah, I'll bring mine dad, dog, dog down. You build relationships. Mm. It's very, very easy to build relationships. If you're not servicing someone, it's very easy to break them. But to get that initial footfall in them shops, taking the transition from shop manager to sales representative, I wanted to get as much information on these shops as I could and have it in my favour. And, like, you've got to be a people person. You've got to service. You've got to respect them. But most of all, they're the bread and butter for every company. Mm, of course they are. Without sales, you're not paying your media team. Yeah. You're not paying your marketing staff. You're not paying your social media. You're not paying your web developer. You're not paying your anglers. Everything resolves down to sales unless you've got like superior backing, big investors, unlimited cash flow. But the way of the world, it isn't like that. Mm. So sales is everyone's bread and butter. And uh, yeah, I just wanted to devise this little plan and it stood good stead for me and if you're a people's person get on with people don't burn bridges sort out their returns because I worry about selling after so I make my shop appointments I go in the first thing I say is alright lads uh, right, let's just start off on a bad thing do you want a cup of tea Dan blah blah do you want a drink yes please got any returns for me to sort out I sort out their issues I sort out their problems Yeah. and then I worry about do you need anything I don't go up to their stands and say oh you're out of so and so do you need this do you need that I let them tell me you know, and it's their money they're spending. I'm not spending their money. And that's how I think I've got good relationships. Yeah. And it takes time to do that. Yeah. And a black book. Get on the black book. Get on the black book. Pattern them. Dan Hawk's black books. They'll be coming out soon. <laughs> yeah. Um, talk to me about Sonic then, because obviously there was that transition initially to Sonic the brand. How did that chapter end and how did it then, or did you find your way to Ridge Monkey? Again, shows. Uh, they're great places where... Brands meet, brands yeah. talk. I actually knew uh, Paul and Robbo, uh, the two of the main people at Ridge Monkey, when I worked at Fatfish because we sold the toasters. And at the time it was like Diablo, Ridge Monkey. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And then this is a great little product, Air Dry Tower. And uh, I did a open day for Sonic Sports at Keswold's Angling in Romford. Right. Uh, and Dave was there at the time working for Corda. So I did an open day and got to meet Levy. Always respected Dave as an angler because your time coming through fishing, you see a lot of people over social media, well-respected anglers, you see a lot of them. And when you go into, like I was a salesperson, like I don't class myself as a named angler now. I certainly didn't back then when I was a salesman for Sonic and I'm in a shop with Dave Levy, uh, yeah. who's, who's working for Corda Developments, the one of the powerhouses in Cart fishing. Yeah. Uh, so I did this open day of Dave, and he, and again, he was like, fucking hell, mate, you're selling a lot of gear in here. You are like, wow, what what are you doing? I just like, just I just go up to people and finding out what they like, what they're doing, yeah. in finding out about them. When you find out about them and like, because everyone's different. Everyone's got a different budget. Everyone's got a different opinion. Everyone fishes different waters. So to give someone the perception that you're the same as me or the next person who walks through that door is the same as another person who works there. They're not. Everyone's different. Yeah. And everyone's capabilities are different. Everyone's mentality is different. 
And that's how I look at people. I don't think, and even when I'm fishing, I, like, if I see two people doing the same thing, they might be doing the same approach, but one might feel the lead down better than someone else. Everybody's unique. Everybody's different. And when you go to these people, some people come up to you with bags of money. It's like a game of poker. They show you the hand straight away. <laughs> I've got £700, mate, to spend on a set of rods. Oh, £700. Okay. <laughs> well, uh, do you want like XYZ, blah, blah, blah. The other person might come up and say, mate, unfortunately, I've got 150 quid for three rods. Well, then you've got to go to this budget. Casting capabilities aren't the greatest and blah, blah. And even if people have got bags of money, I didn't necessarily always sell them the best. Yeah. I'd sell them what they needed for the venue that they're fishing. And then they'd come back to me in a year's time and say, thanks very much, mate. You really helped me. Got better at my casting. Got better at this. I now want to go to the next level. So it's repeat custom, isn't it? It it is. I don't think like, just because someone's got loads of money or someone shows they've got loads of money, it might might not mean that they haven't. You know what people are like. Some people are blasé. Like have a wallet full of money, but you go to the bar, they're the last one to buy around. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just like, a few just, of them, just, 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 <laughs> they're, they're just like walking around and like, yeah, really big bollocks, like big motor outside. Yes, yeah, on eighty grand finance. Well done, mate. We could all do that if we really wanted to. But uh, and but some people genuinely have got money. Yeah. But you haven't always got to sell someone. Some people want the best, so they buy the best. Buy. I used to. I used to always think like, if I can sell someone the items that will get them fishing well get them fishing effectively, then in the year's time they come back and buy the best if they want to, you know? And I did this day with Dave and lo and behold, about four months after Dave joined Ridge Monkey, uh, been the greatest acquisition Ridge Monkey's done because Dave Levy's Dave Levy. He's like the most hardworking, ruthless carp angler. He's a machine, isn't he? Like the biggest thing Dave said to me, like I love catching fish, I like getting bites and, he said, Dan, you've got the capabilities and the angling ability. When you turn up at a venue, change your mindset. Go there that you want to catch the biggest fish at every given opportunity and then leave with your head held high. And that is what he does. He turns up at venues. <laughs> he turns up at venues yeah. and his main sole target is some lakes are a bit different. Like he goes, he's, he's fishing some places where it ain't the biggest, but it's the bollocks. It like is so much yeah. history about it. He goes there for that one fish. He's so tunneled vision. And that's what I think you need a good, Not he's not a full-time angler. He's a paid angler, an angling consultant. You need that tunnel, tunnel vision and drive when you're doing what he's doing week on week. You can't just go to smash him up, hit him up venues and have loads of pictures for social. He wants that one that is great on social, but it means everything to him. Mm. And he's put that mindset into me now where, from doing the great escapes and the filming with him and the time around him, again, the sponge thing, you become absorbent. You learn off good people. And he's one of the best I've ever learned off. And yeah, being in and around him, you can only ever better yourself. And that's the sort of thing I took from him as an angler. Yeah. But yeah, he was at uh, Ridge Monkey and I was working for a show, uh, the big one show, and he went, Dan, you've got to meet this, meet Paul. I said, oh, I spoke to him on the phone because I used to buy off him for uh, Fatfish. And when, uh, yeah, come come and have a little chat with him. And if this is a funny story, this is, and Paul brings this up all the time. So I didn't meet him. Setting up the stands, it was quite frantic, but they was at a bar that night. Right. At the shows, everyone goes out for a beer, yeah. has a laugh. I was out with the Sonic lads and couldn't make it up. Coming through reception at this bar, there was Paul, Jay, Dave, and Derek. And Derek used to be uh, Ridge Monkey's returns manager. Bless him. He was like the heartbeat of the company. It was like him and Gareth were the heartbeats of the company where they'd done so much but got not didn't get the credit yeah. that those two yeah, deserved. Yeah. So I dealt with my time a lot with Gareth. Gareth, absolute beautiful man yeah. in every way. And, and this guy, Wes, I was the same. He was our returns manager. I, yeah, I never and, met and, him, but and, everyone says the same. Yeah. And unfortunately, he, he passed away and it hit the whole company and all of us hard because he was such an integral part. And... Uh, this Derek's Derek, Derek was quite an old boy scouser, Everton fan, top guy, genuine top guy, like mega guy. They're walking through reception. I'm walking the other way, and I was like, "All right, Dave." And I looked up, thought, "Fucking size are these two, Jay and Paul?" Like, fucking hell. And I thought Derek at the time was one of their old mans. Like, I did, I did. I thought he was one of their old mans. Derek fell over, like tripped over accidentally. Oh. And Paul turned around and went, "Fucking hell, you tripped him up, Dan." And I was like, "No, he ain't." 
I actually ain't like a bottom lip going like a baby. I was like, no, yeah, I ain't. I ain't so, besides these two, I've not tripped him up. And it was like a bit of a joke that they always said that I tripped him up, but he didn't fell over. And it was, uh, we sat down having a beer and yeah, they, he said, come over to stand tomorrow. We'll have a little drink at the stand. Uh, we'll go over to one of the like, beer areas. And he said, I want to sit down and talk, talk business with you. I said, I've had a couple of people mention you to me. We're looking for a sales manager for Ridge Monkey. Uh, I'd like to see what you want to do. And I was thinking, wow, this has like really progressed well. I've gone from, I've worked in the trade now, 12, nearly 13 years selling fishing equipment for Fat Fish, Sonic and Ridge Monkey. And I think this has progressed fast. I've worked for Sonic for 18 months, two years. And now I've been asked to be a national sales manager in charge of Ridge Monkey. And at the time, mm. it was another hard life decision because at the time they didn't have an array of products. No. Nah. Sonic had rods, reels, bivvies, bed chairs, and I was earning good money, like good money, like sales uh, and commission for looking after my area. And I was on a, a very good screw and enjoyed it. And I, I enjoyed it. But, but Paul said, yeah, mate, we would like you to come and work for Ridge Monkey. We think you'd be a great asset. And they believed in me since day one. Uh, they genuinely, Dave put good words in. They watched me. They they said they spoke to shops again. They spoke to to mm. find out. Oh, oh, Dan looks after your shop for so and so. How's he getting on? Oh, he's he's an, he's an asset to Sonic. He's really good. So that was sort of it. Paul gave me the opportunity. Big life decision. Company based in Liverpool. Me based in Kent. Looking after at the time the whole of the UK. It was very very daunting task. But I like daunting tasks. I like challenges. And if I believe. I can do the best of my ability at something and I'd be working for a brand. They gave me a little insight into what was coming. Okay. So I was going to say, because on paper, on paper, dressed on, it up on, nicely, on paper, if I've got Sonic, established company, you're doing an area sales job. And but that's, that's going well. It's going well. And it's a big company. It's pretty solid. Yeah. You've got Ridge Monkey, who, when they came on, I remember working when I was at Carpology at the time, Power Pack came out, brilliant. Toaster, everybody using it. Maybe the start of Bivy Lights, maybe the first one, but there was three products that really stood out. The rest of it was a bit of an unknown. Yes. I, I would probably have gone safe, especially yeah. with a little nipper and stuff, yeah. and stayed at Sonic. A- again, I think it comes down to when you believe in someone. Like mm. Andy at Fatfish believed in me. I believed in him. Ian McCormick at Sonic believed in me. I believed in him. Paul believed in me from the moment that I met him. And I believed in his, again, He had. he's got that business aura, the will to succeed, the drive, the passion, the enthusiasm, not sleeping at night, doing things 24 hours a day to get things done, hitting deadlines. And he said to me that, Dan, we got a five-year plan for Ridge Monkey. And they were like a couple of years in, that five-year now plan has now been achieved and they're now working to the next five-year plan. So what he has said has been no bullshit, just hard work, dedication, and he's done it. So I was like, I'm going to take this job. This is going to be a, a risk, uh, but I like risks. I don't do anything half-hearted. If I can put my effort, enthusiasm, my beliefs of the way that I think I can do this job to the thoughts mm-hmm. and dreams that Paul had for the brand at that time, I thought, this is a good partnership. You know, you know like I'm a bit similar to him. I've got the work ethic. I've got the drive. I've got the enthusiasm. I've got the passion. Just like you have here with Alan. Yeah. You know, like there ain't anyone in the trade who's got the enthusiasm, the bubbliness, the worth ethic that he that he gives. Yeah. And I'm like a jack in the box, the same. I can't sit still. And if when Paul gave me the proposition, I took it. And I, I and I think I've took it and I've helped take it to the next level through my hard work and dedication. Man, I just look at it as a as a sort of a new startup in the time that it started to where you are now in, let's face it, a very short period of time. That's a great effort, an unbelievable effort. Like, and a lot of that's down to marketing, product development. Like, there's a lot of unsung heroes in the brand, yeah. and as every brand, yeah, you know, like the the faces of the companies get the plaudits, but also, mate, they cop the shit, the negativity, yeah, the trolling. So it's a it's a hard balance. Like everyone's been trolled. You all get people say that your products are wank. They're no good. You get trolled at like, what does that bloke know? Like yeah. everyone gets trolled and it's part and parcel of being, again, I don't believe I'm a named angler. I don't believe I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm certainly a sponsored angler for Ridge Monk and a few other brands now. And people ask me like, 
to get like I, I don't do tutorials, mm. but I've given a few people a tutorial, but I've never charged them. I do it free of charge because of if you're I'm, gonna be inundated now, mate. No, <laughs> set your inbox. Done hawks on Instagram. No, like, I, I'm I'm too busy, but yeah. uh, there is like the people that do tutorials and they charge. There's reason to mm. because they're the best of the rest, the creme de la creme, and they've been there, they've achieved it. They've forgotten what most will ever know. But if I can help someone take away a few factors on a short session, then I'm going away happy, that they're going away happy. Talk to me about two things. Happens to everyone, trolling. How how do you respond to that? Because it's imminent for everybody, especially if you're involved with brands. Yeah. H- how do you deal with that? What do you do? Um, does it affect you? I'm quite an open person, an honest person. And... I haven't properly yet been direct, directly targeted mm. by, say, someone who's digging me out on social media. They dig the brand out yeah. for an item, and then you get tagged in it, you get pulled into it, as everyone does. And I'm always very diplomatic. Like, I will I will reply to the person if they're digging the brand out, but not heated. I will do it in a way where I conduct myself professionally as a sales manager. If it's an issue of a product, I'll conduct myself professionally and say, completely understand, mate. Here's the contact number for them or ping me your mobile number. I'll direct message you or I'll direct call you. But do you really have to put that on social media to mm. cause brands trouble? Like, I, I don't like it when I see, I don't work for sir. I only work for Ridge Monkey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't like it when I see that you guys have to do sort of videos to combat trolls or other people at other brands or brands are getting trolled. I don't, f- and, and and in football, like look at the football recently, like yeah, them guys have given everything yeah. for our country and yeah, they're in a privileged position. They're paid lots of money. They're the faces of the euros for our country, Yeah, but they don't deserve to be slated. Yes. I understand if someone's got an issue with a product, that is the brand's, that is the brand's problem. I understand that completely. That is the brand's problem. It isn't an individual who's caused that problem. If someone, like on lakes, I hate negativity, and I'll touch on it later in a bit, I, I hate it. Like, I would love it if there weren't trolls, but there wasn't internet negativity. But do you know the thing that comes with internet, te- internet negativity? Positivity. Because you see the people that are the brand lovers, the, like, the people that like the brand, that are defending. And we don't want people, if it's our brand, your brand, or other brands out there, we don't need the general public, but it just shows that there's normal people out there. Yeah. That everyone has problems, right? I'll tell you this now. Everyone has problems. Everyone has problems with quality control. Everyone has problems with shipping. At the moment, the fishing industry oh, is in turmoil because of shipping. And it's not just the fishing industry. It's pharmaceuticals. It's people delivering carpentry equipment, uh, tool workers. Everyone is having big problems with shipping. So... I understand the frustration of people who have laid down deposits or they're going away and they need products to come through from our brand or someone else's. Without me swimming out in that ocean and trying to bring a bait boat, for example, yeah. we're, we're releasing our bait boats. They're in in a couple of weeks. By the time this goes out, they'll probably be out. And that's been a headache for me because we've sold a lot on pre-order. Yeah. Shops have sold a lot on pre-order. And I understand the customer's frustration. I understand it completely. If I had bought something and paid all that money out, I would have wanted it at the quickest opportunity. But when it's stuck out of the sea and there's shipping delays and then, and then there's customs delays, yeah. these aren't excuses, Hassan. I'm not like trying to say... I'm, I'm, I know, mate. And I'm not trying to say it where it's just our brand. It is the world at the moment. And you see the rise in uh, shipping containers. The customers at the moment aren't really getting a massive increase in all the products. The no. brands are taking a hit. Yeah. Yes, some things have had to go up. Some things the brands have took hit on percentages. And like, we've air freighted a lot of items in to keep shops and customers happy and made minimal money. Yeah. Because you want to keep face. Yeah. Just you to supply w- the just demand. Just because you want to supply the demand. Yeah. And But the customers don't know that. They don't know if it comes here by land, sea, Usain Bolt running it across the. Like, they don't know how it gets here. They don't care how it gets here. No. If they've paid money, they want their products. And I understand that. But to be negative, writing all over social media, being like, what, what I don't like is like uh, brands cop it because of issues with returns. If an angler's done something or for whatever reason, yes, do it. But sort your issues out with that individual person. 
don't pull it all over social media. Yeah. But you can't you can't beat you can't beat you can't beat trolls. If someone's that sort of person, they've got it in their mindset, they want to do it, they're gonna do it. You know, and that's that's my thoughts. Yeah. And like, I haven't it, the brand's been targeted, yes. Yeah. Individually as anglers, some of us have like even for the likes when you go away, like you catch a sixty pounder, people are like, It's a shitter. What what well it's it's not a forty pounder from an old old historic lake in England, but Everyone has their own views. Everyone has their own beliefs, and everyone's entitled to them. Yeah, that's yeah, how yeah. I am. Like, yeah, you're entitled to your opinion. I'm entitled to mine. An opinion's not an arsehole. Everyone's got one. Nice, <laughs> you, nice. You, you know, <laughs> day to day, I spoke to a lot of people and seen a lot of people comment and say stuff with regards to positivity, but on Instagram. But the perception that comes across is that your job, sales. I know it's sales, and you've talked about sales, but your job in the face of it is fishing every day catching whackers, going abroad, filming, having a jolly up, loads of beers with the lads, 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 lads and fishing, mate. In reality, it's miles from that. It's nuts. Yeah, so a general a general week in my life is Monday. So so on a, I, I start from a Friday. So on a Friday, I try and work out my call. I work from home on a Friday. I work out my call plan for the following week. But my weekly call plan could, like this week, it, in, it endeavoured with shop appointments yesterday. So, oh, sorry. So, Monday, I was working from home. I was very fortunate working from home on Monday because we had lots of products arrive. Containers came in. So, I was working through all the back orders, mm. which is a long job. I was tra- changing over 362 orders on Monday to get them orders on the system to service the tackle shops. Yesterday, I was in three tackle shops. One, I measured up a shop fit. So, 3.2, 3.75 metres of racking. Tidied two shop displays and did orders for all three shops. Yesterday I did about four hundred and twelve miles, so that's a relatively normal day in my life. Service station food, or my wife kindly does me a bit of grub. So that's my first two days of the week. Then I'm in here today doing a podcast. As soon as I leave here, I'm going to fit, uh, going to measure racking at Basildon Angling. Cool. So I'm going straight from here to another shop. Yeah, and I'm measuring up more racking. And then from there, I'm going to Churchgate Lakes yeah. to go and measure up some more and sort out a bivvy display area. So I've not just come here today and people think I'm coming to do a podcast. That's my day off. I'm not. I've got work after this. Tomorrow, I'm out filming new products with Dave Levy at Lake in Essex. And Friday, I'm out filming new products with Dave Levy in Essex. Then next week, I've already got my call plan for next week. I'm in head office in Liverpool for three days and two days on the road shop fitting. And so my day-to-day life is manic. Yeah. And in between all those appointments podcast I've got emails I've got phone calls I've got follow ups I've got lots of other things in that day to day life but you can end up neglecting people yeah mate I'll call you back in two seconds blah blah I'm on another call but I don't ever want to do that no and but you you have to do that you have to do it mate and you 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 can't not because you're one person yeah you have to have a very good understanding of one you've got to be Mm organised you can't be like writing bits down on scraps of paper. I'm organised. I've got one notepad for shops. I've got one notepad for when I'm doing my shop visits, working out racking. In my van, I've got uh, spirit levels and like if the floor's uneven in the shop, I've got to work out what I've got to move. And it isn't just day-to-day sales. My job isn't day-to-day sales. I'm, no. I'm, I'm, I'm doing product filming. I'm doing the great escapes. And when I do the great escapes, I go away, whether it may be around Europe. And believe me, it's a chance of a lifetime. I'm going to some exceptional venues mm fishing for incredibly large carp as a job. But while I'm away, I'm still answering phones. Sorry, let's can pause the camera a minute. My phone's ringing. I've got to do a sale. So I'll pull it up on my computer. And I store it all, write notes down. In the evening, I get up at five o'clock most mornings on The Great Escape. If I haven't had a take, that's woken me up. Five till seven, I do emails in the morning. Then we start filming at seven. And we start filming about eight usually. So I have an hour. Bre- Paul does everyone a bit of breakfast. Then I do eight all the way through till six, filming Great Escapes. But if they go off doing a bit with Jay or a bit with Dave, then I can get my sales in. Now I'm throwing all the shops back. Usually finish at about six, and then I work, sometimes I've worked till midnight on the Great Escapes, putting orders up, whether that be streaming internet on Oriana in Spain, <laughs> Zumba, Zaki. I don't stop, mate. Like, and No. I've got that sort of worth ethic, but my wife, like, I come home some evening, and she's like, oh, I'll put the phone down. Yeah, talk to me about that, mate. Two nippers. Yeah, two. Two and a girl. Two yeah. lovely kids, yeah. Girls. Girls four, and my son's 12. Right. My, my daughter's four, uh, just finishing her first full year at school. She's the youngest child in the whole school. 
lovely little girl. Like, like she's she is like the apple in my eye. I love her, and <laughs> I'm like, little daddy's girl. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I'm away a lot. Yeah. So how does how do you balance that? Uh, because I have a very under very understanding and very supportive and very unique wife who's got an amazing personality and loves me dearly. Clearly. Because most people would have jogged me on, and I'm not. I'm not. I'm not just. I'm being deadly honest. There's been times where it's been hard, and we've had conflicts and arguments because, like one trip, I was away for 28 days. That's 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 a month away. That's no, 27 days. It worked. No, was it 26 or 27 days? I went done a week filming in Carpland, so straight to Abbey Lake, straight to Lake Serene. So three weeks back to back with travel included. Uh, and when my wife's uh, a managerial accountant, she's a very intelligent lady. Why she married me? And, uh, <laughs> one bad decision's all right, though, isn't it? Mate? <laughs> yeah, she's she's allowed one bad choice in a, a a life full of it. But yeah, so you like she's she's a very intelligent person. Do you feel that though on a on a on a personal level with regards to especially when you've got kids involved, mate? I I I'm I'll be completely upfront and honest. I I definitely do sometimes when I when I've been away for periods of time or, or I put it on the missus I definitely feel like guilt and a bit of but at the same time you feel like you do it because it is for your family but it's hard mate I, I sometimes struggle with that what, what are your thoughts on that because 28 days is a long time away yeah uh, and like 19 days is average for a great escape so some venues you do a week yeah most venues or you do two venues week to week back to back yeah. so like we done Parco in Italy and then went all the way to Euro Aqua and that's 28 hours home, so you're away 19 days. And like the biggest thing I'd say from a wife is she is the best role model. I wouldn't say role. Yeah, she's the best role model for a mother because she's phenomenal, you know. Like she's a manager accountant, mm -hmm. so she does work, but she juggles her work and her work are very good. Uh she's a manager accountant and she she juggles that and they're very good to her. She juggles it with picking my son up, dropping my daughter at school. And my son, all three of them are a very tight unit. Mm. I'm in that tight unit as well. And we, we have got a lovely family and I feel blessed every day. Like I wake up in the morning and don't ever take for granted when someone says daddy. Yeah. You know, and that's a big thing that sets home to me. And, it, and, it, and when I'm away sometimes on The Great Escape, I've got two little teddies. One's the pirate out, the pop-up pirate. Yeah, you know, like the way you put the sauce yeah, the in, game, and, and, and the he, game. he pops up. Out. Yeah, the yeah. pirate out of there, my daughter says is me because <laughs> he's got a beard and I've got a beard, <laughs> right. and he's on the water all the time, and I'm always on the oh, water. Nice. So the pop up pirate is me, and I've got a little green duck, and the ducks are from the ducks from my boy, and the pop up pirates from my daughter, and I take them every every trip I go away on. And there's times that you get upset. They might be at school, so you can't do a FaceTime. And I just look at those two little pieces of sentimental equipment mm. that they've given me that are nothing. They're like pennies, but they mean everything. And when I'm away, I've missed some very big things while I've been away. I haven't missed anyone. I haven't missed my children's birthdays, but I'll miss the wedding. I'll miss the wedding anniversary, the trip I had a 78 pounder, which is not good. Like Not a bad present though, is it? 78 pounder. Yeah, not too bad. But you, if she's not going to listen to this, is she? What would you tell Oh, she, she will be watching oh, this. Probably. <laughs> we'll, we'll avoid that question then. So that... So I missed a wedding anniversary, but my wife is so understanding, so loyal, and I wouldn't be where I am today yeah. without her love and support. And the biggest factor is I know I wouldn't be here without her help because when I worked at the Channel Tunnel, she put my job application and CV in at Fatfish Tackle without me even knowing. And I had an, I got contacted and said, Dan, you've got an interview. That's a Great win for you. Every argument, mate. Realistically, you've started this. Yeah, so you, you put you you put me in this position. I'm away for like a year. I'm gonna go fish and catch everything massive. But you put me in for this, so <laughs> it, it, it doesn't matter if it's the first time, the last time. Yeah, you're away a week, two weeks, two days, ten days. You miss the people that you love, and I love my wife. I love my kids, and they yeah. love me. And as I said, I do everything every day to day. To provide a great life for them. Yeah. For you, and we'll move on to some epic fishing um, chapters, but as a round off with regards to career, and you must get asked this a lot because of your success, what would you be your standout pieces of advice to 
people out there who want to get involved in the industry in some capacity. I know that obviously yeah. everybody gets them. What what are the things? Because it's changing. It's it's changed so much since you worked at Fat Fish. Yeah, to now. Since, to now, it's a completely different industry, and yeah. it's developing daily almost yeah. at the moment with the amount of anglers and everything else. What are the standout things that that you would recommend to people? The thing is, like when when I worked at Fat Fish, and a tackle shop is a great starting point because I never believe. Well, you just don't you don't know, you don't know what's going to happen in the future, and I didn't know that I'd be sitting here talking about my life in sales at fishing mm. from starting off as a sales advisor in Fat Fish Tackle, <laughs> you know, and it's a, my life journey in fishing is one that I hope people can re- would like to relate to and would like to get into because to be associated with the fishing industry is a great way of life. Yeah. It, it can be stressful, but all jobs are stressful. But you're involved in a, your job position is involved in a hobby, a way of life, a passion. Like fishing's in me. Yeah. If you rip me open, fishing's in me. So is football, my family. And it's a way of life and... To be involved in the industry, I feel blessed. Job opportunities, they do come about. People like always write to me, I never see any jobs in the trade. They do. The biggest factor is put yourself out there. Be willing to learn. Be like a sponge. Be exorbitant. Like when I worked at Fatfish, right the way back then, I was having serious anglers come in that shop. Like, and I was behind the counter selling to these people thinking, Fucking hell, these people know more about carp fishing. <laughs> I've caught British records. Yeah. They've forgotten about more about carp fishing than I would like to know. Like Oz Holnesses, Paul Forwards, you know, Leroy Swan, like some serious, serious Kent anglers. You meet some great abundance of people. And when those people talk to you and give you any insight, any little bit of knowledge, there was times where so- certain people left the shop and I'd write notes in my phone because of the things they told me and I didn't want to forget it. It was that key, I didn't want to forget it. And it's the same when I did the shows and I got a little bit close with Daryl doing a cord. I went out for 24 hours with Daryl when I worked at Fatfish. Certain things he told me, I'd write them down. I, 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 it sounds bad. Like, what did you write down? Do you remember? Uh, just little things about watercraft. Just like with, with, with Daryl uh, and Oz, their watercraft is phenomenal. Mm. And it ain't always about rushing to the swim, going there with a preconceived idea where you caught nine the week before. You walk that lake until you find them. You might see one. It could be 10 somewhere else, 10 somewhere that's very unexpected. And just their mannerisms of arriving at the lake, the relaxing, the, how relaxed as well. Like Paul Forward is such a relaxed person when he's there, he's fishing, he's in his own little bubble, pops the kettle on, don't worry about getting the rods out and you see other people racing to swims. And I think I've took a lot of that into my angling. I've, Learn off even at Sonic when I went like the top like two years with Frank going out of Frank. Mm. All these people are different and all these people are unique in their own way. And if you can learn yeah. a percentage of one, percentage of another, percentage of him, percentage of him, absorb it all like a wet sponge. And it's made me a certainly a better angler, a, a better person with some of the life things that other people have told me. And I think if you're willing to learn, you're willing to listen is key. Let people speak. If someone's telling you something, don't interrupt, don't overspeak them. Let that person finish because they might tell you something at the end of that sentence. If you cut them short, you might not get that golden ticket. You let them people finish. Exorb knowledge. Exorb enthusiasm. And that pulls into you. If you're around infectious people, you become enthusiastic. You become bubbly. Confidence is a big thing in life, not just in fishing and in sales. If you're confident, enthusiastic in something, you believe it. You're believing in that product, so you're confident. If you're confident in your angling, you're getting bites. You're getting where before casting out. Oh, that'll do. No, 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 no. That won't do. Back out. Oh, fuck it out. That's a bite. <laughs> you be- confidence yeah. is a big factor in everything, every way of life, fishing, sales, and I think any youngster, young. Middle-aged, old age, you want to get in fishing, you believe in it, you put everything into it, you put your heart into it, you believe in your own ability, you're around infectious people, you've got the will to listen, the will to learn, passion you need, enthusiasm. Very, If you're, if you're married, you need a very supportive wife. 
because I couldn't have achieved what I've achieved so far in my fishing journey without the guidance of my wife. You know? Or husband, mate, if you're a lady. Yeah, yeah. Or, or if you're a lady that wants to get into fishing, because there's lots of more ladies that are coming into the sport now. Yeah. If you're a lady that wants to do sales or get into the industry, speak to your partner, confide in each other, and take the, smuff with the, the smooth with the rough, because yeah. it ain't always plain sailing. Like I'll come home some day, slam the door on the van, slam the door on the front door, jump on the sofa. Very fortunate, I've got a little bar at my house, which is like the tits. I've opened the fridge, dark fruit. Oh, like Dark fruit, man. There's more of that. Dark fruit, Dan, they call me. Yeah, dark fruit, Dan. <laughs> yeah. And uh, it's literally just unwind, you know? Don't take things too seriously. Don't take yourself too seriously. And also, like, when you see job adverts go out from brands you see some people all of a sudden start changing all their hashtags or start changing to try and be associated with that brand. And I've seen people do it mm. because they want to get that job opportunity and change things. Just be yourself, mate. Like I'm a people person. Uh, I try and get on with everyone. Don't try and burn any bridges. If yourself, if you're yourself and people like you, you've got a good aura, you will achieve in life, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. but it's a hard work, desire, be driven. Jobs do come available in the fishing industry. If you get one, take it with both hands and fucking enjoy it because that's all I've done. Yeah, too right. <laughs> We're going to move on to fishing and there's loads. We're going to talk about local Kent success a little bit later. Yep. But I wanted to start with just some of the continental foreign escapades, mate, because you were thrust into that. Yes. Before sort of the whole great escape. Yes. How much continental fishing had you done? Much? Uh, at all? I had done trips to Gigantica and Gigantica Road Lake through Fatfish. Oh. Uh, being friends with Andy, being friends with Danny, our work trips would always be there. And I experienced my first blank in France at Gigantica Main Lake. Went there, went there in November. One fish was caught and it was from Peter at the Tackle Box, who's like the one of the main guys at the Tackle Box. Lovely fella. Real good friend of mine in the trade. But he was, at the time, I was working at Fatfish and we was like, not competitors, but he's man, sort of manager of a tackle shop and I'm manager of a tackle shop. Sort of competitors. But now he's, uh, my relationship with him has developed loads and he's like, that was the only fish caught and he's a genuine top guy. So I've done a little bit abroad, Lake Serene, which I always go to. It's my friend's uh, mum and dad's lake, which is the most magical place. And what makes that place so magical now is the biggest fish in there is a 101 pound common which some people would be like messaging me in a minute. How do I get on there? Like serious lake, mate, like serious carp, some big named anglers go there to catch that fish. 101.4 is the biggest it's been. That is ridiculous. And it's a beauty as well. But with that, the lake's got like, that one lake, going off on a bit of a tangent, has got like, bloody hell, 35, over 58, 60 pound. And it's, How big's the lake? Ten and a half, eleven acres. No, and it's just it's majestic, mate. Like you literally, you turn up, you walk through the gates, and you're like, any one of these swims is the bollocks. I would love to spend a week here. This is amazing. Like big overhang willows, lily pads, weed. It's not your typical yeah, French lake. Yeah, it's yeah. an estate lake. Deep, shallow, mixed. Nine tens in certain areas. Right. But every takes electric, hundred pounder. Like oh I bet every takes. I, I was there. I was there. Uh, yeah. Just previously, I was there. Just done ten days quarantine, week on the road. Three weeks ago, I was there. Hard week, really hard. Just after spawning, you think they'd be having it. Fourteen fish came out. I had eight of them. Couple of mid fifties, which is good. Eight, eight out of like six anglers. I had eight out of fourteen. Couple of mid fifties, forty eight, forty seven. It's a nice fish. Really nice fish. Uh, yeah, just nice to be away. Hundred and one pound comedy. Yeah, so I done. I dabbled down a little bit there years ago. Is a bit younger, but then three, four months after joining Ridge Monkey, Paul said, "Look, lads, we're gonna have a social. We're gonna go to uh, Zumba, and it was all planned to go to Zumba, and then we did Zwolla, and a week before Zumba, another venue became available, mm. a place called Bay and Zenya, which." was a 120-acre high-dammed reservoir where, like, you could fish one long row, 20, 30 anglers could go on there, 120 acres, big old bit of water, 400 yards to the other side, B 
big overhanging trees, snags. But no fishing off that side. No fishing off that side, yeah. fishing from one side. And that was sort of my real taste of friendship with Dave Levy because I'd been doing the sales for a few months and we went there to promote some products, have a social, all get together. And Paul fished with Jay. I fished with Dave. And, yeah, the friendship was born like Double D. Was talk talk the- to me about that friendship there because you're like – in some ways, very similar, but I could imagine it being a bit competitive, boys. Like, I can't imagine, like, do you know, it, a it, lot of banter, but it, I could imagine it, it, it being... It, it was funny because that was my real getting ready preparation. We went to a meet in Essex and uh, obviously I was, I was when I worked at Fatfish, I used Mainline. Uh, so I've used Mainline for years and Dave was obviously with Mainline. So we sorted all the bait out and they said, lads, take uh, 150 kilo of boilies each. I was like, where we, where we, like, this must be some big fishing into that 150 kilo boy. It's a lot of bait. And you sort of think you're going to overgun it. You're never going to use that amount of bait. Mm. Me and Dave borrowed bait on the second week. Jeez. It was ridiculous. But the journey, like, it was just great. We met at my, my wife's mum and dad. They live on a farm uh, 20 minutes from Channel Tunnel. So everyone met at theirs. Really nice. Like, everyone got to, my family, Emma's, my wife's family got to meet all the lads. And really, really nice. Like, it was great. My new work colleagues became friends yeah it was quite a nice moment and then and they met family which was nice and i was the long journey to me and dave 25 hours in the van with me and levy the first real time getting to really know him hearing about what he's done and what his captures and i knew what he'd caught but when you hear it it's like reading a book but someone doing an audio bible next to you like reading it to you. It's mad, mate. He did this. He did this podcast, obviously, but like I had to cut like three quarters of what he'd actually caught. Yeah, it's madness. Yeah, and I was quite nervous as well fishing with him. From what I knew, he only had caught at that point. My European PB would have been from Serene, and it was 48, 48 12, I think it was. Right. I hadn't had a fifth. No, no, no. It was a fifth. I had actually foul hooked. Right, I fail up. You claim right. no, it, no, yeah. no, no, I haven't claimed this. Right, so I'm going to edit this no, out. No, to keep this in there. So that trip, I had a fifty-one-two, grassy, but I don't class them as like the biggest. So it was a forty-eight pounder, but I fail hooked a sixty-eight common that trip, and I unhooked it and put it back. So I'm not, I, I didn't Good claim effort. it at all. And everyone there was like, "Mate, that's so and so fish." I unhooked it and put it back. So my PB would have been fifty-one, but we don't count grassy. It's big, like. I don't want to be disrespectful. Big chub. But don't, don't we don't count them. So it's only like forty eights. We're going to this place, hundred and twenty acres, and I'm fishing doubled up with Levy. Big fish track record, big fish mindset. I could only learn off this guy. You know, I could mm. I could learn off this guy. And we started fishing long. We turned up down the draw and we come out fucking shocking, like really bad. You wanted to be right up the damn wall, damn walls at each end. And the fish loved the damn walls. One, patrolled up and yeah, down. Yeah, just like patrolled it. up the yeah. damn walls, a bit deeper than it was really nice, like the features, all the all the moss and algae growing up the damn walls and there's not natural habitat there and there's places for the fish to go. And the central swims, they were like, yeah, Catfish City, and me and Dave got Catfish City. And I was thinking, right, here we go, let's just get set up, get sorted. We started off catching well. Dave's first bite was a big cat. And we was like, here we go, this is going to be fun. Were you, was it towing out in a boat or were you uh, casting? Some people were towing out in a boat and my friends own UK bespoke bait boats. Good and, friends to have. Yeah, and at that time, they had literally had a boat out two, two, three weeks, and they gave me one of the first boats, and now they've gone on to be a really successful company. I've used it since day one. That's another subject, like bait boats. I'll touch on that on European fishing. But So we, we started at this venue. They found a spot. Uh, I think he was a lot. He had him. Yeah, basically had empty spools. He was down to like four turns of line on the reels. And a couple of times, he was like, did he, did did. And then there was in the tree. So like, there was a little bit, the point that came out, him and Dave Moore were fishing. We was catching fish quite consistently, but nothing really big. And there was rumours that there was fish to 70 pound in there. There was rumours. No one had really seen. There was two fish that we'd know that were over 66 pound, 30 kilos, both caught by one Dutch, one German fella. So the target for the trip was a 60 pounder. Mm. So we're there and I saw two fish top and it's a bit of a pattern because I, I when I'm at home, I can't sit still and I can't sit still ever. When I'm fishing, I'm quite, if something's happening, I'm moving, I'm adapting. But there, you couldn't actually move at the bank because it was so sewn up. But you could move spots from up to 300, 400 yards out. Yeah. In. This fish rolled at 100 yards. Rolled, another one rolled at 100 yards. 
So I'll put a, put a lead out there. Lovely little spot. Put the bait bite out there. Put loads of bait out. Didn't fish it for the first day. Loads did, of I, bait? What do you mean? What are you talking uh, Two boat loads. So eight, nine kilo. Yeah, good old Eight, nine kilo. Yeah, yeah. A good old help in a bait. Just boily or... or no, we was using boily, uh, crush boily, chop boily, whole boily, little bit of pellet, but you don't want loads of pellets to the cats. Mm. And I think, off the top of my head, I, fi- I can't... One of the venues, I don't know if it was out of Zimbabwe, was using a little bit of tigers and particle, but it was quite a while ago now. And fished a short spot, first night on it, had a take, 40 pounder. So that's my first biggest, my biggest fish of the trip, got another 40 pounder. Then put the rod back out, next morning, mist rising, the place just looked, it just looked amazing. You're on this big, massive lake, mist rising, mm. sun's coming up, electric take, like s- mental take. Pulled up into it and it was just like this. This is this is big. I said, Dave, I got a big cat, mate. Got a big cat, massive cat, mate. Like I don't, I don't fish the forty out. I was like, mate, it's fucking massive. Had it on probably a good 10, 15 minutes. This fish and it didn't show itself at all. And down in front of us, we was on. It was like a ledge, concrete, and then there was tires to more concrete. And the catfish were just sort of coming in and sort of in, in banking themselves. Yeah. And then we had the lad called Liam. Liam and Dave was in the swim. And they was like, man, he's still playing it. And I was like, mate, this is, I don't, if this is a carp, it's, it's big. And I was going, no, it's a cat. And it was like right under the rod tip and it just popped up. This massive carp, the biggest carp I'd ever seen at that point. Yeah. Been there, caught. Cool. Dave netted it and he went, yeah, mate, that's done 50 pounds. Really pleased for you, mate. Put it on the scale, 66.2. <laughs> so I'd done it. Jeez. And then everyone was like, all, everyone come round and, uh, this is quite a while ago now. My first year at Ridge Monkey, and I, I was the first English person on my first big European filming trip for Ridge Monkey. 66 pounder, 30 kilo fish, and I was the first English person ever at that venue to catch a fish. Catch a 60? To, ca- no, to catch a 30 kilo. Oh, so wow. a 66 pound. 30 kilo is like a sp- yeah. real specimen in Europe. They, they want them over 30 kilo. And yeah, I was the first. And it's sort of where all my fishing dreams mm. had became reality, but the job opportunity had made my dreams sort of fishing dreams come true. Yeah. And it was just a momentum, momentous me, uh, moment when it was a hard week. Not a lot was caught. Me and Dave done really well. Uh, that was the best fish that week. Why do you think you did well in that unfancied area then? Obviously you had a few catfish, but why do you I, think? I think it's because we did a bit different. Everyone was fishing at extreme ranges to sort of structures or snags overhanging uh, the trees. We came off them. After I had that fish, we came well out in open water and I think that we was putting bait where the cats weren't patrolling, whether it because it was a different depth for mm. uh, the the food source that we was putting out. Like a lot of people were using fish more boilies, and out in Europe, the boilies aren't unless they're getting supplied from like yourselves mainline out in yeah, Europe. Not. The consistency of the baits isn't yeah, great, yeah. so I always try and take my own bait that I'm full of confidence in. And sales always been that for me. I take that; mm. it's gone everywhere, catches fish, and it's done the goods on the first filming trip ever. And then the week after, we went straight from there to Zumba. And Dave had an 88 pounder, the biggest yeah, fish in the lake. Flip. That was an absolute chunk. Yeah, uh, same sort of similar tactics. Short again? No, Z- Zumba, we were uh, ruthless. So that was when the real first, sort of first time that. Ruthless. That was the first sort of time that me and Dave got serious. What does that mean? Talk to me about when me and Dave got. Because Dave's pretty serious. That sounds pretty serious out there already. You've just caught a so, 30 kilos. That, 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 when I mean serious, this is where Dave told me to be more clinical in my angling to succeed. Go on. So fish were, was at Zumba. You're allowed 120 yards. Like It's agreed by everyone on the lake. Yeah. You're allowed that distance. There was a, not no man's land, but fish between everyone where everyone was, like a little vicinity that was like a safe haven. Yeah. So I knew how to wire the bait boat lights so the bait boat lights could either be on or you'd turn them around the other way to the negative and the lights would turn off so we tested an area on one rod sent a boat out to no man's land being ruthless Dave had one rod in no man's land 58 fuck it I'm putting a rod out in no man's land <laughs> I put a rod out in no man's land 56 pound common smash my PB <laughs> common put another rod out in no man's land Dave had a 62 pound common Put another rod out in no man's land, 88-2. So that was where we what sort What a run of fish that is. That was where we sort of... We, 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 we just gelled, you know, like Dave's got lifelong fishing mates on his trips, like Aaron Cop and some people that yeah. he's been pals with for years. But me and Dave just gelled. We got on from word go 
and loads of banter. Like the, the reason why we do the Ridge Monkey films is we want the trips to show we are like-minded anglers. Yes, we're involved with brands. We're brand ambassadors. We can't be, to put it, you, you can't be idiots and make the brand look bad. But we go away, we have a beer. Like everyone goes to France, they have socials with their mates, they have beers. That's what they, fishing is. They have laughs. Yeah, yeah. The great escape is all about an escape. Mates going to have a laugh, bit of beer, bit of banter, bit started on that trip. Like, what do you mean? What was the banter? Because that's quality in terms of turning the lights off and going into no man's land. Yeah, so 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 no so no one else on the lake yeah. realised what we was doing. We was doing it late in the evenings when it, when it got to dusk and early morning. So we was never putting them out in midday. So it, so it, so everyone on that trip now will you, probably watch my podcast yeah. and think those two who, who absolutely carved it up. We now know why. <laughs> it was, uh, so we was uh, we in, so the, right. in, the day, in, in the in the day in in the daytime we was resting swims. Yeah, or fishing to our original spots, nicking the odd one or two, then had a little switch up. And that was like, that's the hunter instinct in Dave. He's like, he, like, he, he, he drilled it into me. Dan, if I was at home, I'd be casting 20 yards further. Mm. We don't want to annoy everyone else. So we're not going to tell anyone. They won't know because they're going out in dark. And we just... But it is an edge, isn't it? We might hey, what the sun shines. Yeah. And we did. People were coming around the swim going, like at one point we had six or seven slings in the swim and it weren't that like we was retaining fish because we don't want to retain fish. There were 58s. There were like 52 to 68s. There was like just all there to be filmed because it was like at one point I think five of the six rods went. So you're just dropping, you're not dropping loads of bait in there, just literally a fishing single for hop. A bite. Of, yeah. Fishing for a bite. On certain venues I've gone to, you've gone for big hits, smash yeah. them up, bait and weights. Yeah. Most venues I go to fish for a bite. Same as I fish in England, I fish for a bite. You don't want to overgun it but when you start getting bites and you build hits, you then put bait in to keep them there so no one else is catching. And I've had some big hits in Europe. I've had some seriously, like, great trips. And But that was sort of where, like, everyone called it Double D. Me and Dave sort of gelled, got to know each other, had banter. What banter? Yeah, like, uh, Bay and Xenia was good. So we all reeled in one night and had a party on the bank. So I've got a big boombox speaker playing loads of old tunes, like... Bit of UB40, oh like all just goodness. chilling out. And one of the locals rocked up with a bottle of Jaeger. Oh, no. So we drank a bottle of Jaeger, and then the owner of the lake, the actual fishing guide, had to drive miles to the lake and say to us lads, we've had a complaint from the village. So that where we was on the lake, the village down the road were moaning that they could hear us partying on the lake at two in the morning. <laughs> you know, it's like, just like, just like silly things. You're like, you're not, you know, when, when there's like lads there having banter, you're like, you're messing about being, people being macho. I can do, drink this quicker than you. I can do this. But like, isn't that not where all that challenge stuff came that's from? That's where it all come from. So Dream, Believe, Achieve was the first sort of filming yeah. production we did. And it was that, it was, first ones were Bay and Zenya and, pa, and Bay and Zenya and, and Zumba. So we sort of put, I wouldn't say we put them on the map, but we made them a bit more commercially to UK anglers. Zumba, definitely. Yeah, by seeing, and Zumba's incredible, mate. Like, mm. the last time we and Dave went there, we had 40 fish over 40 pound, and I had, no, I had a 68 pound common. I'll touch on that again, but we had some serious big fish. But what helps is, when you've been there once, yeah. you know what works. You know how much bait you've got to put in to get a bite, and it really pays in your favour when you go back. And that... From Bay and Zenya and Euro Aqua, the next plan trip, uh, Bay and Zenya and Zumba, the next plan trip was Dream Believe Achieve 2, which would be Parco. And. Parco's madness. <sighs> Parco smash up, mate. It's mental. How much bait did you get for it, Parco? A lot. So we went So we went to Parco and everyone I spoke to, Frank Warwick had been there a lot, does, yeah. gu- does guide in. He Guides said to me, Dan, certain areas you need to be in. The week we was going, you need to be in certain areas. I knew it, I knew it was a good area because they all nicknamed it the aquarium. Mm. You ain't going to call something the aquarium that, has, that doesn't house resident fish. And this is how crazy it was. So I came out quite good in the draw. I think I came out at 11 or 12. I came out like sixth. So it's like mid, mid, mid place. Dave came out second to laugh and got his second choice swim somehow. <laughs> And me and Dave were like, had a carve up in his back bay. It was like a car, it was mental. Absolutely mental, mate. Like, everyone chose their swims. I chose peg 17. It's changed now because they've take, removed a lot of the snags. Okay. 17 and 16 is was predominantly sort of like uh, an R shape, an, uh, like a right angle. Yeah. 
uh, but on the reverse, so a lot of right angles that way, but it's on the reverse. And uh, this bay was just snag heaven, overhanging trees. It was like a, a house, a sanctuary. You walk around there and you, you literally, you couldn't be standing on more fish. I've got videos on my phone and there's a hundred fish under the snags. Hundred fish, 50, 60, 70. They're all massive in there. This well. huge, mate. And when I said to Frank, like I said to Frank, I've got in there. He went, right, don't fuck about, get a rod out. And I was like, well, I literally had a rod, red, red, like a couple of rods ready, one rod rigged up with, an, with just a, I think at the time it was just a standard Ronnie before I'd done the slip D rotate. It was just a standard Ronnie, put a, put a yellow pop up on, whacked it out there, just left the rod on the floor of a net, and one of the blokes nearly finished setting up, rolling, because I was like trying to work out. If I was going to put a rod out or not, but I thought well, I'll put a rod out. I didn't even walk back to the van. He's gone, Dan! Rod skipping along the floor. My first 24 hours at Parco, I had 27 fish in the first 24 hours. <laughs> what was the average size as well? They're uh, big, aren't they? Yeah, they are huge. Well, I, I I had 109 fish in a week. I had 114 intakes, 109. I've got. I've still got, funny enough, I looked the other night and I've got them all listed on my phone still. What? And I had 28 fish over 40 pounds, 1050s. Oh, that's obscene. So another, so that's like my, I'd done really, really well at Bay and Zenia. Yeah. I'd had caught fish up to 58 at Zumba and then gone to Parco. And at one point at Parco, all three rods went. I had a 52, a 54 and a 57, three fifties, uh, triple take of fifties. Completed it. Which is like, uh, it's all on film, a hundred fish. And uh, all fishing tight to those snags. It started all off in the snags and then I found there was an area, this is where you're lucky when you have a film production crew that lads can pop drones up. Yeah. So the lads put a drone up and there was a really, really nice plateau and it was black. And at first we thought, okay, that's, that's, a, that's, that's dark. It's not your normal clay. What was that? Yeah, because there's not any weed in there, is there? It's pretty... Little bits of yeah, like onion not, weed, eelgrass, yeah. nothing to worry about. And then all of a sudden when the drone was up, the dispersing it, they all just dispersed and it was carp. So it was, it was homing in on this plateau. And then that plateau done for me something like 16 fish over 40 pounds in 38 hours. It was like 40 hours. It was just mental. I didn't fish at night. The first night I fished at night, I didn't fish any other nights to get in sleep. It was ridiculous. It honestly has, and it was ridiculous. That's unbelievable. So I finished a the week there on 109 fish. Again, you said fishing for a bite at a time. Method and feeder. A hit. It's all bat, like little solid bags of method feed. Yep. Work. So uh, Frank gave me the good advice uh, to go there for solid bag. Solid bag work well. Mm. Pellet works really well out there. Yeah. But I won't lie, we had the luxury of bait boats. Yeah. And everyone else is spawning. But that venue, the spawn is a dinner bell. Like when the drone's up, if you're putting a spawn out, you see the fish moving into the noise. It's not like, oh, yeah, you go to Linear, it's a dinner bell. Parco really was like a dinner bell. People were putting out spawns and you was watching the fish migrate to the sound. So we was put, oh, we was doing it a bit different. We was bait boating, and Frank said going with solid bags. But we had a very hot week. It was like thirty degrees. Started making up bags. We had a tack in this. My hands were sweating. It was dissolving the bags. Oh, yeah. So I literally ran around to Gareth and scrapped off everyone. I said, "Lads, who's got any method feeders?" They're like, "What do you want them for?" So I just want to. I, just, I didn't tell. Didn't really tell anyone the plan. Started getting scalded pellet from the lake. Loads of scalded pellet from the main line. Getting it warm. Molded method feeder. Start. I started off by putting the 10 mil essential cell on a short braided uncoated hook link yeah. inside the method feeder. In like you ball. would be fishing for like F1s, yeah. like fishing. Yeah. And uh, dropped the bait boat, 10 minutes gone, <laughs> bite 50 something pound, bite 35, bite 28, bite gone. I then thought, you know what, this is like too much aggro. I'm just going to fish a method feeder and not even put the rig just in the bait. It. Yeah. it was going even quicker. I had 109 takes, mate. And it, it got to the stage where I ran out of pellet. I was in getting boilies damp with stick mix liquid chops, moulding boilies round it. It didn't matter. Just didn't matter. It was that just, is nuts. Uh, it was just a trip of a lifetime. Something I'll never ever, I say never emulate again. You just don't know. But I've never in my wildest dreams ever thought I'd go abroad, let alone on a filming trip. And have a hundred carp. Well, that's just ridiculous. But also as a starting point, like when you go on a filming trip. The starting point is to get a bite. You want to exactly. bite for camera. You don't want to blank. But also, you've never done it before, mate. Your sales, you've gone to do a filming trip with Dave Levy, daunting. You've gone on to a run. To get that first bite is such yeah. a relief. This is, this is what I mean. This is why I feel privileged day to day because my job is sales. And when mm. they said, Dan, do you want to come to Bay and Zenia? I had a 66. I'd done well. I caught the biggest fish out of everyone there. And some very good anglers from Europe was on that lake and I had the biggest fish. 
what like Dave got into me as well. You could have a hundred fish carve up. People always remember the biggest. Yeah. And that's the true. That's true, mate. Like we've gone to some venues and had 60, 70 fish between two of us, but they remember the big one. Yeah. And they do. People love big fish, big fish, big fish sell, you know, like people love big fish. Went to Zumba, caught big fish there. Parco caught big fish. Went to Euro Aqua, straight from Parco, on the high of having a hundred fish. Really didn't care that what I caught. Yeah. But there's a chance of a hundred pounder in Euro Aqua. Yeah. Euro Aqua is a special venue, you know. It's uh, yeah. That get, talk to me about. I've never fished it, but it gets it gets mixed reviews. Massively mixed reviews. So it ain't for everyone. There's no bait boats. Uh, you can't drop rigs from a rowing boat, which some people like to do. Mm. It's all casting. Usually 100 to 120 yards, anything up to 30, between 25 and 30 wraps, and you're fishing effectively on good areas in every swim. But you can go out on a punt and fill it in. Okay. So, so I, went, I went there and I was doubled up with Gareth. I was on the left-hand side, out of bounds area, and my biggest for that week, I, I had four or five fifties, but they were, you get blase, right? So that was only my fourth big European fishing trip at Ridge Monkey. Mm. A 50 pounder to me is a very big fish still. Like a colossal fish, even now. Yeah. But all the other lads had 70s. Right. So I came away with, I was happy, I had loads of fish, but I didn't have a 70 as did Gareth, Dave and Jay. And the lads were like, oh, you're not in the 70 club. Like they, like always, like what Dovey's just had with like, obviously the, yeah, yeah, the monster yeah. carp scenario for them. The other two would always catch the big ones, but he'd catch the most. And it was similar like that scenario for me. I wouldn't always catch the most, but I'd always, I'd always do all right. Yeah. I've, I've, I've never not gone away and really, really struggled. I've always done all right. I've always held my own to say, to say like against good anglers. And, uh, Eurorack was a different kettle of fish. Marker poles out in the lake, you go out in a punt and on the side of people's sheds, they have them big blue water butts, 100 kilo, water, 100, 100 litre water butts. <laughs> two of them full up a particle. On one, two of them full I've up. Seen a, it. Two of them full up of particle on one rod. So you're talking 200 litres of particle on one rod. You don't even turn the punt around and the pole's moving because the fish are there. It's not everyone's cup of tea, but now in there, rumours are four or five fish over £100, which is colossal. Uh, everyone's got different views and opinions on venues. If we went back there for a filming trip, I'd go back because you're fishing for an absolute monster. But what are you fishing over the top of that? It's all part of part the game. Yeah, yeah so, I, so I, I, I was fishing on one rod. It's, it's mad because you put a lot of boil out as well. Yeah. But I was fishing over on one rod. I was fishing 20 mil because I wanted to deter the smaller fish. Yeah. I was fishing 24 mil bottom baits and 18 mil wafters that I'd had specially made, banoffees and cells. So you're talking nearly like 40, gob 40 mil gobstopper yeah. set of baits. But you're still catching 20 pounders because their mouths are like... Like them Hungarian fish, <laughs> they're monsters. You put your arm in it up to your elbow. and Or on the other scale, you catch on two little plastic toppers yeah. catching 50 pounders. And Do they scrap Comp- comparatively with, let's say, I don't know, let's go for um, like a Parco fish. It's similar like in terms yeah, of... Yeah, pa- pa- Parco fish were strong and powerful. Yeah, they, 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 they really fought. I had a fifty-three pound. When you arrive there, there's a gallery on the on the wall. Yeah, and everyone sort of chose this sort of near lever, fifty-three pound lever, and I caught it. Uh, it's colossal. Uh, honestly, uh, the the fish is a beaut. It's just beautiful in every way, and just yeah. you admire it and respect that fish. And I caught it, and that was like a torpedo. It was up and down through the weed, overhanging willows. It was just trying to do me in every way it could, and. Some of them fish at Euroaqua, they do really, really fight. And, and other big fish venues, they do fight. But I play more, I, I don't beast my fish. I play my fish quite light. Like mm. A lot of the lads say, come on, mate, get it in. Like, but I play them quite light because one, I want to enjoy the fight. Two, I don't want to pull out of it because it could be the fish of a lifetime. You're fishing venues that have got yeah. world record carping all the time. And every venue you go to is potentially a new PB. And I know every angle is different. I talk about techniques earlier and uh, capabilities. So I enjoy my fight and I I don't lose loads. Touch wood, I don't lose loads of fish. Like With a style I touched on this year, the rig I used, I, 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 don't, I don't lose lots of fish. And losing fish is part and partial of carp fishing. Yeah. That's where you learn and adapt and you try and eliminate them fish losses. But fish losses happen and they happen for a reason. It could be mouths are soft, mouths are hard. Your way that presented a certain rig, it didn't blow back when they sort of suck, blow and feed, 
it might not have like, caught in the right place and the mechanics of some rigs mm. might not suit certain situations. So you have to fish the right rig in the right situation. And when you do a lot of angling, you learn the scenarios, you put all the favours in your own, you put ev- you, you put the percentages in your favour to catch every opportunity. And when you're going to them venues, mate, you can't lose fish because make or break, right? You have a hundred pounder at one of these venues. Yes, you'll be an internet sensation. You'll get trolled. You'll get, oh, mate, it's a shitter from so-and-so. Oh, you've caught it from this venue. Oh, it's not good. Or part and partial, you've had a hundred pounder. <laughs> yeah. Whatever brand you're it's associated elite, with, whatever yeah. brand you're associated with, you catch a 60 in England. That's a, that's a colossal fish, and you've joined an elite bracket. You might not be the best angler to join that elite bracket, but you're one of very few who's caught a 60-pounder. Mm. You go abroad and catch a 100-pounder, you're in an elite bracket. You might not be the best angler, but you've caught it. You've earned the right to be in that sort of bracket. Yeah, you can't take that away. You me. can't take that away for someone. Once they've caught it, you can't take it away. And a fish that size... Them venues, they're record breakers, mate, and they mean a lot to people. Like, don't get me wrong, I've caught some very big fish that aren't the best looking. Lo and behold, I've been very lucky. My personal bests are actually quite attractive, nice looking, some scales on them, dark carp. But appearance for me on some fish in the UK is everything. But when you go away, everyone remembers the big one. It could look like. It is what you go away for, though, isn't you it? You go away to catch big fish. Go, yeah. And, like, it, it, like you might net a fish from certain venues and look at it and go, but it's £80. Pound. Here we go. <laughs> hey, feel the burn. Yeah. You know, like, it, it's part and partial. You, If you don't want to catch them fish, don't fish them waters. Mm. You know? And we're, we're privileged. We're one of very few select brands that go to amazing venues with amazing stock, and we get to call this a passion, a job, a lifestyle and we're there enjoying the environment catching bloody big fish and there is many people that would take my place so every, oh. t- every time I wake up and I know I'm going one of them trips I look forward to it more than ever yeah, like, and ev- right. every trip's different and every trip's graph like we've been some places it's been oh Carp Lantus we Hard, went- yeah hardest place I was going to say was yeah, Carp Lantus we, we went to Carp Lantus and I was never great in a boat and that was daunting for me because that was 40 foot deep and when we arrived, stipulation was second any you lads get a take, you're playing it out in that boat. On like if you can have someone come in and row with you, but if you get a take at two in the morning, you're not gonna wake people up before you've got to get in that boat. So I sort of manned up, learned a lot about myself, and by the end of the week, couldn't get me out of the boat. I think it takes something like that to make you dig in, push boundaries, and achieve things in life. Mm. And you don't see people go to Shanty and like your Cassians and just, you don't see, well, how can I put it? You don't see people go to those sort of venues and think they're going to smash it up. Those sort of people go there for inspiration. They go there to adapt in their angling. Unless you're, you learn in fishing every day. You don't know everything. I don't know everything. I certainly don't know everything. And every trip I take stuff away. Every trip I go away, if I can always put a couple of things in my black book, Notes mentally that I can remember that helped me on my next fishing trip, whether I catch or I blank, I've learned and I'm going away happy. Mm. And when you go to these tough, challenging venues, and to be fair, we haven't really been to any on the Great Escapes. Oriana was a tough, challenging venue, 12,000 acres, the latest one, Spain. That was everyone out of their comfort zone. That was what we've never done. And that was the most enjoyable. We all learned the most. We all took most away from that. What did you learn? You've done a bit of boat work by now. You said that Yeah, I've done a little hole. bit of boat work by now. So Carp Lantus, I learned in the boat that you to go to net fish, you've got to go out in the boat. Certain ways that the fish are pulling the direction, like you you try pulling with them, the boat's spinning the other <laughs> it's way. A night, mate, and yeah. at night, like you're out there and it's literally like, oh, he's got one, there's a lighthouse out there. It's like a lighthouse. The boat's going round and it's quite true. Do tri- you have some shockers? Yeah. Uh, my first forty pounder from Carp Lantus was uh on the film. They probably cut it to make it look pretty spectacular, to be honest, because I was like Rosie and Jim without yeah. like round, round. I was going round and round and round. I was out there that long. I had ducks landing on the boat, <laughs> like, like, and, and the lads were like, "Get it in!" Then and it was on the top. I've gone to net it, and as I've gone to net it, as I've like put the rod the other way, the boat's just spinning. Yeah. And 
So you, you learn and you adapt in angling, but it makes you a better angler. Hundred percent. And you're always learning. Anyone that tells you in any any walk of life, they know everything. They're talking shit. You, you don't. <laughs> you, you don't. No. I like to challenge myself. I don't. I don't want it easy. I I like it easy because you're getting bites in. You get rewards when things are hard. Yeah. And you set yourself targets and then you break that target. And then it becomes boring an- if it's too easy, mate. Yeah, and then you have another target. Don't get me wrong, it's amazing on camera. When the camera's rolling and you're having a you're you're having it off. Yeah. But there's times where the elation when you're not having it off and you have that one that makes you not have a to put it bluntly, a shitter, and you're going to blank on camera, because we all do it, mate. I, I'll tell you this now, right? I'll tell you what i say it on camera. We arranged a local filming shoot uh, for The Great Escape. We had one uh, get cancelled abroad. Everyone bigged it up, and uh, me, Thomas Duncan Dunlop, Dave and Jay, we went to a local lake, and they're like, oh, you're going to carve it up. Five nights, never done five nights ever on this lake. I'd always done... 48 hours at the very most ever filming. Usually a quick night between work when I worked at Fat Fish and that. I'll drop on there. Nice lake. Loggies. Loggies yeah, lake. Yeah. I know I know it really well. Blanked. Yeah. And you can't always make it happen. And you're only human. Like, I ain't a robot. We have feelings. And that hurt. Yeah. I know them people there well. I know that lake well. I got a good swim. No excuses. Caught nothing. Mm. That's part and partial of fishing, mate. And I think that you can't hide the fact that people blank. No. And I think the viewers and people would like it more to show that we are human. No one's superhuman. No one, no, no one's a robot, you know. Everyone's got feelings. They have their they have their own plans, their own approach. And like Dave caught a couple, Jay caught a couple. But me and Tom didn't get one. We didn't catch one. But, but that's, there, that's part and parcel of fishing. Exactly. But there is a point where, and sort of marketing and media perpetuates this, is that it's always about raising the bar. Like a few years ago, it was, you know what I mean? You, you could go and do a, a feature and maybe catch, I don't know, a 30, a 20, and, and that would be happy days. Nowadays, it seems that if it's not got a 40 or a 50 on it, that might be domestic or abroad. Yeah. It, the bar is set so high yeah. and there's only a certain point at which you can keep raising that bar. There is. The reality of it is, is that there's a lot of money being put out and there yeah. are times when those results don't happen. Yeah. I know it doesn't necessarily make the most entertaining videos, but as no. you say, it's, it's fishing and it's part and parcel of it, especially big fish fishing. Yeah, it just it just shows you're natural and that's what I mean. Like uh, When you go on them shoots, you have pressure and like my pressure is I'm a salesman. I still work when I'm on them shoots. Mm. So I try and balance work and filming while trying to speak and be in contact with the family as much as possible because I'm away. And it is a really, really hard balance. But that trip, like, everyone was like, Dan, you're going to smash it. And, like, I had a bit of added pressure on me because I was a local lad. But I do sort of thrive on pressure. But that hurt. When I, when I didn't yeah. catch at that trip, that hurt. And that shows you've got emotion, you've got feeling. Uh, and I wanted it to go out and be a great film for the owners who I've got a lot of time and respect for that have always let me fish there. But it just didn't happen. And with these trips... You don't always have it your own way. I know everyone thinks like, oh, it's brilliant. You're away. You're doing this. You're fishing for a living. I'm not. Like, like literally, I don't, I haven't fished a weekend in England for six, seven years. Mm-hmm. I don't, I don't fish weekends. I do one night a week at most, at very best between work and shop visits at the very best. Unless I'm filming like this coming week, I've got to, a day, a night and I leave the following day. And them European trips is actually a chance to express yourself, enjoy your fishing enjoy the company of others, like-minded anglers. And that's why we've done The Great Escapes, because, like I said it earlier, it's three mates going away, enjoying each other's company, catching big fish. People can relate to it. It's not serious. Loads of product thrown down people's faces. You do do it subtly, because you want to get product in there. You're not going to spend all that money on a production no. and not put product in. Yeah. Let's go away for two weeks and not talk about anything that Ridge Monkey sells as a product, as a brand. Yeah. And uh, I just think that, them trips abroad have made me such a better angler because this last 18 months I've been using a boat in England yeah, and I probably wouldn't have done because I was now using it abroad. Like Oriana was a different kettle of fish, mate. Yeah, you were saying, sorry, I interrupted your train of thought. That that, is... That latest instalment that's going to be coming out for Oriana was on everyone's bucket list, but you're talking like 
31 miles in size, 12,000 acres, colossal piece of water, really deep in some parts, mm. unbelievable uh, cray infestations. The substrate on the bottom is... There's there's lot there's crayfish pots everywhere. So you're out in a boat like we was fishing 440 yards out with braid, near enough empty spools, three wines on, one bleep. You're out in a boat getting above it. Serious fishing and like Samir, he's, yeah, he obviously Samir's lives out there. Yeah. The great insight. He let me view his video before I went out there. Helped me loads. I know him from local from fishing in Kent with him, mm. and he was a top lad. Proper help, proper help me. The guide that we had out there was phenomenal. Uh, but it was just very challenging. It was the you have to your mindset, your tackle and the way that you approach it has to be different and it has to be good because if you weren't on them, like there was case, I moved, we moved, I moved twice and I caught a couple and they moved off. 12,000 acres, if they ain't on them, if they're not there, not there. You That's, could sit, you yeah. could sit there three weeks and just hope they come. But like, again, as Levy does, Levy did it, he smashed it up. He had like seven forty seven forty, which is like <sighs> phenomenal. That film is going to be phenomenal. I think it's actually going to be like a two-hour film or, or two one hour, one hour. Colossal for everyone. Just Tactically, loads of bait or bites at a time again? No, just fishing, on them. fishing bites at yeah, a time. Yeah, just like, get on them. Like, literally out there, it was... Uh, we had a guide who was very good, Edwin. The area that he put us on, he put us on an area... Cause the locals out there, they're only allowed to fish weekends. Uh, so they have little clubs and they have fishing clubs and they're allowed to fish weekends. And the area that he put us on hadn't had a lot of line pressure. So it's quite a good place to start and target. Mm. And when it's something of that size, you have to go by local knowledge. Like, yeah, let's just rock up and have a walk around. Like you, <laughs> we'll have a you, couple of pub chucks yeah, here, mate. You, 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 you ain't doing it. And near, near enough empty spools on braid, 440 yards was the maximum distance we were fishing. Tigers topped with corn, strong uh, fluorocarbon or 35 pound camera X hook links, braided mainline, 30 pound braided mainline straight through. 12 ounce uh, or two 10 ounce grippers savage like serious fishing like mm. the most I've never fished rainbow Cassie and Shanties them yeah. sort of places I'd love to but I've never done them uh, this was my first experience of big water wild carp fishing yeah. and I loved it yeah I loved it I bet caught well no whackers but, but just to get a just bite to get a bite, it, like yeah. the, the sole aim. We said five fish. For, we said five fish for the trip. Five fish for the trip, and we've 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 done well here. And it just went. Except it excelled. I don't want to give too much away. It just excelled. It was it was amazing, and that was my biggest fishing challenge to date. And I felt like I grabbed it with like a bull with both horns, jumped on and rid it into the sunset. I, and I loved it, and I would go and do it again. Good man. Yeah, uh, for you out of that whole sort of continental chapter, your standout highlight highlight is it that fish from C- I can't even say Sazaki. 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 Yeah, I, I think I pronounce it wrong. That that Sazaki moment will be a moment in my carp fishing I will never ever forget. Talk and to I, me. Talk me through it. So, in a in in a short period of time, I think over the case of like two years abroad, I've had twenty seven in, in a little period like twenty seven fish over fifty pounds, which is from a lot that's of different quality. from a lot of different waters. Which is that's quality. Yeah, it's it's good going. And like, there's trips where me and Dave have had forty forties in a week, which is like a lot of fish. The latest, the, the second, the second, the second Zumba trip, uh, which I touch on just on Sazaki. But Sazaki, we went to Sazaki with Max Cottis. Thomas Duncan Dunlop, Colin uh, Wollogful, I think that's how you pronounce his name, Colin, if I've done it wrong, I apologise. Uh, Dave Moore, serious, big fish, European pedigree anglers. Been there, done it. Been there, the done it, caught t shirt. So had Dave, so had Jay. Mm. I had done it on some venues, but this venue is different because I use a bait boat and I've got no qualms in telling people that I use a bait boat. When I go on these European trips, a lot of them they allow a bait boat. I've got a uh, UK bespoke bait boat, graphical echo sounder, rain marine, autopilot system. The biggest factor for me is if I get a bite at night, I still, I, what, I, what I like to still do, I, I'm quite tech and no tech. Okay. So I mark my spots through the echo sounder, but then I put a lead in the boat, take it to the spot, let it go down, then I wrap it up. So I've got a mental note. So I've got the wraps. So I know how far I'm fishing to an horizon marker and I don't always rely on the echo. So every time every rod's going out, I, me and me and Dave, we wrap them back up, put them in the boat, 
then we know if something goes wrong with the technology, because it can happen, batteries can cut out, you're fishing effectively still. But the autopilot system means that you can get your rods back at two o'clock in the morning mm. to the spot as accurately as possibly can, effectively. So I use a bait boat on a lot of these for journeys or the use of a Ryan boat if a bait boat's banned. And love them or hate them. People don't like boats. Everyone's got an opinion on them. But uh, some of these fish that I've caught, I wouldn't have caught without the bait boat. And that's that's no bollocks. I'm not, I'm not ashamed to say it. And, and all the other lads on the trips, they wouldn't have caught some of the fish they've caught without a bait boat. It's just part and parcel of the angling that we do on them venues. They allow and we take them. Yeah. You want everything in your armory. So Zaki was different. All casting. I've never been a big caster. The lakes that I've cut my teeth on around Kent, all quite small ponds, 22 wraps maybe, most chilling meals. Fish scaffolds, maybe 26, 27, but not like over 30 wraps consecutively yeah. spawning for a week. And all the boys were like, yeah, we're fishing at 38s, 42s, 41s. And I'm thinking, wow. 42s? 42 wraps. Who's that? Uh, Tom, Colin, Jay. Serious. Big lads, though. Serious, serious chucks, mate. Like, yeah. And fishing effectively and accurately. Yeah, it's baiting at that range. Yeah. Accurately. This. And I was travelling over thinking... Couple of swims as a short chuck. I wonder if we get them. <laughs> Please. <laughs> but we didn't. It's a really bad draw. I've never, we're never good at draws. There was something like 14 people in the draw. Uh, Dave was ninth, Jay 10th, and I was like 12th. So I, so I had a shocker. Like an absolute shocker. Uh, Jay went in one good swim. Dave went in nine good swim, which commanded a lot of water. Eight to the left of Dave was empty because it wasn't the greatest swim. So I went in nine and doubled up with Dave. And we started fishing 30 wraps. Two rods for me, two rods for Dave. And I had one at 27, 28. And Dave had one at 33. So there was a, like, a good area. So Dave was picking them off on the 33 straight away. So we thought, we're going to have to go a little bit longer. And I was using the Orbit, our new tapered mainline at the time, like, like the end of uh, sort of product development of it. Yeah, I was using that, the... 10 to ten to 35, I think. No, 12 to 35 I was using. And it really did help me with casting. Like, I'm not a strong caster. I've got a lot better now. Yeah. Through like the efforts of that week. And it got to the stage where me and Dave were putting out two buckets of bait, 17 litre buckets, two each, a day. Yeah, that is great. To keep the bites coming. At 30 wraps. And it was like serious, like proper baiting up, tigers, boilies, whatever we could put out there, they were coming. But where... The, where Dave and Jay was, two more swims down, there's a big island and the fish at Sazaki, if I pronounced it right again, they just go round and round that island. Like It's known to do like, you hit it well, you have 20 60s in a week. Because it's like, there's, a, there's two swims there that are called VIPs. Right. And they're just like the flyers. They are. Guaranteed. They are stupid. And I, I was like, the furthest I could be away from any of this area because I had a really bad draw. And then I was, we, we was catching and like, I, was, I think my biggest was like 38 pounds uh, using the slip D rotators. Like, so uh, we, when we did the great escapes, we went to Ictus and I was using the slip D and Dave was using the Ronin. We was getting a lot of pulls and like, like a few years ago, I sort of put to, I know other people have done it, but I put the slip D situation, put, I put the great, what's the word? I used the, Slip D, the slip D, supple slip D section, I put that onto a Ronnie rig yeah. to create a really good low line pop up presentation that had so much movement and flexibility of the hook without when on a Ronnie, when you've got a hook bead and the yes. mini hook ring swivel, it's tight, isn't it? It's tight and it can move and there's not loads of flexibility and the B can come up and it sort of can go near the barb and the point. And I didn't want any of that. So I've put this little supple section. I'll tell you what, mate, honestly, mine and Levy's captures, because we both use it now, everywhere. And yeah. I mean everywhere. Yeah. I rarely lose any fish. Just with a pop up or with wafter? No, I'll use it as well. solid bags. That's my, that's my solid bag presentation. Is it? Yeah, with a wafter. Hook lays flat, wafted above. But I just think it gives so much movement, flexibility, and the hook holds are phenomenal. Mm. So I tied one of these up there. Shellfish and pineapple, uh, shellfish and black pepper pop up pinks. And was catching on these rigs out there long. Three days in, everyone else had that. Well, do, do you think Jay's biggest was 48? Dave's, Dave had had a couple of 50s, as Dave does. <laughs> and other people were catching 50s, 60s round the pond. And fish showed about 15 wraps out, short. And the words were, everyone there, fish long, 
Don't waste your time fishing. It, it, literally everyone, all the people that are there, the people that run the place, everyone, if you've got to fish long, excess of 30 wraps, there's a, there's a roadway, they come up and down it, they just pass through it. When I'm at home fishing, my time's limited and if fish are showing, I yeah. pack everything down, I move yeah. to get on them and catch. I couldn't ignore this, mate. It was, they, were, they were showing, not consecutively or many shows, but big, big carp. Like if you missed one, it was like, same area. And the rings, the vortexes mm. are like, ah, oh, fuck this, I can't sit my hands any longer. Left rods come in, marker rod out, found an area, and it was actually like a gravel plateau. 15 and a quarter wraps, remember it like anything. Mark a float out, <laughs> none of this whacking out to the middle. Pop the float up, 10 kilo of link all over it. Like red, red fish mill boilies all over it. First take was my biggest fish of the trip, 40 pounder. Rod back out. Got to the point where Dave and all the lads were like, Dan, do not wake us up for any more fish that are under 40 pound. Please just don't do it. Just, just don't do it. We was catching so many, I was catching loads of little ones. I was like, pest control, which sounds bad. But you're busy. Busy. And it was working. The tactics were working. This new spot was rocking. They were coming in. And then I had this take. And the take was, it was like, when I think of the whole the whole scenario back, it was magic. It, it was just, it was, it was magic. And it was a moment in fishing that from the start to the finish, I could never, ever forget. Because the take happened, playing this fish in, oh, a real dogged fight. Like, worked like a sandbag on the bottom. It was like a, ton crane bag it was like Whoa, what is this I was just every time I pulled zzz, zzz, it was going again and I thought carp big carp mate big carp Levy Levy <laughs> she's asleep not asleep Max not wake trying to wake up the camera lads and then eventually one of them came down as I'd just gone to net it and as I netted it it was quite it was like half five in the morning and the mist was rising. It was quite dark. Ed Torch was like sort of blurry. And I because in, in front of the swim, there was boulders and you didn't want to pull it in the front of the swim too far because it would be on the boulders. Mm. So I sort of held it out a bit in the net, put a bank stick in there to hold it in place and ran up and said, lads, I think, I'll, and, and I looked at it because I didn't get a chance to open the net and have a proper look because at that place, you only have a five minute rule, stipulation there. Oh, yeah, From back. the second you yeah. net that fish, you have five minutes so there's no recovery time for the fish, which I, I actually don't I don't think is great. No. Like, uh, I'm not saying retain them for a long time at all, but they need time to recover. But like, you're then going to pick this big fish up, have a picture, and then you've got to get it back within five minutes. And when you're filming, that's quite like, it's, it's, it's hard. Time that's consuming. tight, yeah. yeah it's, it's tight. Especially if the camera crew aren't awake. No, so I had to run and get everyone. I didn't, I didn't even look in the net. So I just sort of rolled the net and stuck a, a bank stick in it to secure it. I've got up and said, lads, I've got a 40. Probably 42, 43. You Keep, thought it was a 40? Yeah, because I did. I, it, was, it was a big fight, but I didn't get real get a real good chance to look in the net. Right. Uh, so I ran and woke everyone up, and they're like, yeah, brilliant, we'll come down now. Paul came down, Dave came down. Dave looked in the net and went, nah, that's quite a good 40. Like, every, it, it blew everyone. He went, that's quite a good 40. And then uh, slid it into the sling. Him and Paul lifted it and went, fucking hell, yes, Dan, you got your first 50. And I was like, yes, oh, man, I can't believe it, a new spot. My new spot, uh, everyone said Fish Long has done a 50 and then pulled the, the sling open, looked in to the net and it was just, I, I, I couldn't even see at the end of his gut where they pulled the net away and it was just like, wow, it might be a 60 and Paul went, it could be 60 pound, mate. So before it went onto the scales, we thought it was 60 and I was thinking, yeah, I've caught a few 60s now up to this point, but... uh wow, this is a 60-pounder from a new venue. I'm, like, blown away. The biggest fish out of everyone so far this week. I can't believe it. I was so buzzing and pumped. Pull it up onto the scales, and it went 78, 78, 6. It just went round, and they went 70. And I, I, I was crying, mate. I, crying, I, full I, tears. Full, full crying. And the emotion, like, on that film, I was, I was in bits. I genuinely was in bits because I'd been on all them trips, watched the other lads... Smash PBs, and I had broken PBs, but I'd never had a 70. And then I was like, oh, well, we, you're not in the 70 club, Dan. Like, we've had 70s. And it's like, not demoralising, because it's banter between your mates. Yeah. But to just... But it's got a bit of needle, though, hasn't it? Yeah, but to, to, to get... To go from being a 40 that I could have slipped back, because anything under 40, we were slipping back. 
So I could have slipped about to go 40, 50, 60, 78. And then to see, to just see how happy they all was for me, it made me well up. And I was like, this is a big moment in my angling sort of journey path. I've had a 78 pounder from here on film with my mates doing the opposite against the grain, which everyone said doesn't work on there. Fishing, you won't get, get them short. And I did. So it basically what that trip did to me, it made me realize you believe in your own beliefs. Mm. It made me believe in, believe in my own ability. Like I wasn't a strong caster. I left casting 30 wraps comfortably all week, but I caught on my own terms. Yeah. I caught on a short spot doing what I know best, fishing with boilies, a rig that's very productive, that lands big carp, and it landed me a fish of a lifetime. And that was part of me where I felt I'm here with these big European big boys. Yeah. And if I even get mentioned now um, with them lads that in the same sentence, old Dan came here and he done that, that like they mentioned my name, I'll be like, I'll take I'll, I'll be buzzed. I'll, be, yeah. I'll, take, I'll take that, you know. And, oh, like, um, I do care about what people think, but I always try to better myself. Yeah. And that day finally came where I'd caught 40s, 50s, 60s. And to have that moment with my boss, my work colleagues, my mates was like a moment I'll never forget him fishing. Yeah, it was magic. like, it was, it was magic. What a fish. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah a, bit, a big, big. How'd you pick that up? Uh, Pure adrenaline. Yeah, but it's funny because uh, when I'm holding it on the film, I, was, I, I remember watching it back. I say like, I can't even, I, I can't even hold it. It's a bloody beast. <laughs> like, because I just couldn't get words out because I'd been in tears. Yeah. But yeah, it's good. And like, at the fishing shows, a lot of people, they come up to me and say, Dan, that moment is carp fishing. Yeah, yeah. That moment is so relatable to all of us. Yeah. We all go away for a PB. But what that, the big thing that trip done for me, it made me realise about believing in yourself. Yeah. You know, like, don't doubt yourself because everyone does it. You know, when other people are catching big ones and you're not, you do sort of doubt yourself. You've got to believe in yourself. You've got to stick to your own beliefs. You've got to trust your knowledge, trust your ability, your guidance. All the things that I've taken in from a young lad working in a shop, absorbing off all these good anglers, taking that knowledge and storing it as one, has made me now believe... If you put me on a lake against some of the very best without being arrogant, because I'm, I'm not going to be arrogant in any way. If you put me on a lake and said, Dan, catch me a carp, yeah. I'll do my very best and utmost to catch yeah. a carp for you. So, yeah, uh, yeah, it, it, it makes the beauty of carp fishing, mate. Those moments, isn't it? Yeah, it that is. is it's exactly what it's all about. But you also, like, you take away from them trips, you take that into your own fishing back in at home. Yeah. And it makes a UK fishing confidence levels like if you're using rigs, tackle, that are landing seventies, sixties all the time, you know a thirty or a forty is going to t- fall yeah. to that rig. Yeah. So you take that confidence boosters into your own fishing, and like it, it's funny because everyone asks people questions when they go to a lake. All right, mate. Uh, like, yeah. How many wraps? Yeah. How many wraps should be? Uh, yeah. yeah. And then and you get some people sort of like bum steer. Oh yeah, I used to fish out there to that sort of point but I was at 13 wraps and then they say, oh yeah, but I was actually at 13 and a half and then they give you the information and I've actually seen it work over hand where people, one fella tried bum steer, I call it bum steering, one fella tried bum steering someone to a spot on a lake that he had been pre-baiting. Mm. So the bloke went to a different swim on the bum steer and caught the biggest fish in the lakes out of back five. <laughs> so it can work both ways. Of course it can. It can work both it's ways. Fish, fish are fished. These fish have got fins. They can go anywhere they like in that lake. Yeah. Certain times of the year you can catch them with moon phases, wind direction, but a lot of things for me, I don't get a lot of time to fish. So when I go fishing, I like to embrace my captures and everyone else's. Like there's been times where you don't always see eye to eye with someone on a lake and it happens with everyone. You can't see eye to eye with everyone. Mm. And I've been at a lake and like the negativity of carp fishing and politics of people, uh, like believe me, if someone's pre-baiting there, you don't go near it. But if you know someone's baited, you just a bit of angling etiquette, you don't go near it. And I've actually been and reeled rods in and watched people catch fish that I want to catch sort of say targets fish as such because I want to embrace that capture mm. that moment that they've got there I want that moment but my time will come yeah and uh, we don't get a lot of that in angling you get a lot of people that ah oh, he's fuck all, he's done this he's done that he don't pay for bait he don't get this and you know, just just enjoy each other's company on that but fishing for a lot of people including myself and for you as well because you've got a busy family work life fishing will be 
one of your releases, yeah. like minor football and fishing. So that release brings joy, excitement, challenges, and all the time you haven't got that and you haven't got, say, targets and desires in carp fishing, you might as well not carp fish. If you're going there to be a nuisance, to be a pest, to annoy people, to, say, just go to have a... Like, people go fishing for a retreat to release, they have a beer. But there is people that go that uh, go there to annoy other people. And, like, and I wouldn't say... I take things to art. If someone says something bad about me, obviously it hurts people's feelings, but there's a lot of people out there that struggle mentally mm. and carp fishing for a lot of people is a release from mental health. So to go to a lake and cop mental health when someone's trying to, or, or, or say abuse, it's just no, I don't think there's no place for it, really. Mm. And, uh, yeah, the, the, the great escapes have let me learn a lot about myself and learn a lot about my mind, uh, my releases in my busy day-to-day life and, I take that into my family life and yeah, it enriches you, doesn't it? it Any does, sort of it travel does, and pushing does. your boundaries. It, it, it does, and you, you're very, we're, we're very, like I said, we're very, very select few people that get to travel to extremely lovely places with big carp. And I, for one, don't take none of it for granted. I feel blessed in my job daily. I feel blessed with my family, and all the time I'm continuing to. If I can continue to help other people, whether it be a fish picture a rig or anything in carp fishing, I'll continue to do so. No, you're a top bloke and you've worked hard and you deserve it, mate. You definitely do. In terms of great escapes and just general fishing abroad, any frontiers that you'd like to go to that you haven't been yet? Uh, to be fair, anything that the brand sort of desire or... What about you? Venues. Take the brand I, out. I, I, will, I will go to. My... I mentioned it earlier, the the, the the real big fish in Serene. I'm I'm now, uh, I've got my own weeks there now, which has been a long time coming because I've always gone with people. Yeah. And it's like fully booked till 2024. But one of the blessings for COVID, uh, which isn't, there's, I don't, to be fair, there's no blessings for COVID, but yeah. people have actually been out had to cancel trips and they've lost trips. Yes. And I've picked a couple of them up and it will mean that I'm going there at, very good times of the year mm. at optimum weights. And my goal is whether it's 92 pounds spawned out or a hundred pound, my goal for European fishing. That's the one is to catch the serene common. That's, that's my European goal. And for whatever reason, uh, if I did do it, then yeah, I'll be overwhelmed. But I also enjoy the journey yeah. of the times when I've just been there now recently and didn't catch it. And the fire's burning for getting back. I've got a big hunger for things. If uh, I, I, if I see something, I want it. And That's some fish you'll have it. I look forward to that Instagram <laughs> post, mate. If yeah. it'll fit on my little phone screen at 100 yeah, I, odd pounds. I, I, I hope so. Because it is nice to have, like, you touch a lot. I relate to Ridge Monkey a lot because they're my employers and, and I go filming for them. But it is nice to have that release and break away from cameras, yeah, away from pressure. Because you do get pressure with film crews there. Oh. And it does take its toll on you. Especially when you're doing your sales as well as the filming. That is a grind. But the great escapes and the anglers that I've been associated with through my angling journey is down to hard work, dedication yeah. from myself. But I've been very exorbitant and took knowledge and tips of some great, great anglers. Yeah. And I don't take any of that for granted. No. And but what I will do also do is that wealth of knowledge that I've been given by then unless it's a secret or something that they wouldn't want passed off, I'll disclose to other people. Do you know why? Because I want to see other people catch fish and enjoy carp fishing as a sport. You've just got no ego, mate. You're just a decent bloke. I don't, I, that, that, that's the, the, the thing is, like, my wife says it to me all the time. Like, She says it to me all the time. Think about yourself. Like, just please think about yourself. But, mm. I, but like, I do and I don't. Like, My life goal is to provide a living for my family. My working goal is to individually... Progress as an individual for Ridge Monkey and take Ridge Monkey to where I know it can be. Like superior to, uh, superior top fishing brand, you know? That's what you and also your job satisfaction, mate, at the end of the day. USA? Anywhere like that? Fancy it? We went to America as a brand. Did you? Me, Paul, Simon McCabe, Ben and Jay. We went to a European expedition three years ago now in Orlando. Orlando. Ten days in Orlando, the five of us. Disneyland, that'll be carnage. 
We t- we arrived on uh, Independence Day. <laughs> oh my! And had a days. big street party in Orlando, and it was mental. Like and I, like to the point where how real, mental's mental? Yeah, crazy. Like first like day, spring break. Uh, first that first day arriving, big live wild festival in the middle of downtown Orlando, thousands of people, and loads of beers flowing. <laughs> And then we went to uh, uh, the Orlando convention and had a Ridge Monkey stand at iCast Fishing Show. Crazy. And, it's, and, it's, and it has set, set the stone for uh, Ridge Monkey USA, which is like another part of our brand, which a lot of people won't know about. And I don't know about it. Yeah, there's a... Uh, so, yeah, there's some there's some th- going to be some things happening out there because of that show them you years ago. You were trading in the rods for the old bass boat, mate. We you went are. bass fishing while we was there. Oi, that's good. Yeah, we went, we went bass fishing while we was there. None of us had any whackers. But, but they're it, good sport, mate, Bass. It was, uh, we met a lot of good contacts in some very good retail outlets because we think camping lifestyle is big out here. Yeah, it's massive out there, isn't it's it? It's incredibly it's big. But also, cart fishing, their scene is Cart growing. fishing's got bigger. Yeah, we, well, we, we had a great escape due there. We was there, I was actually, I had a trip cancelled due to COVID. I was yeah. in Florida for a month. I had two weeks with Ridge Monkey, flew home for four days, and I was flying out with a family. To oh, lovely! But it all went tits yeah, up, yeah, as, as there, it mate. does. But we we'll get back there at some point, yeah. and uh, yeah, there's a lot of avenues that the brands expanding to. The one thing I've got to talk about: Great Escape challenges, mate. Eating stuff, yeah. The so physical this... challenge, I'm I'm quite happy with. <sighs> uh, I think I've won one. I've won one challenge, and that was eating a pig's testicle and and foot curry. And the only reason I did that is because I love hot food, like, and I can eat, I can eat hot food fast and quick, and I'm a very quick eater. So I made sure that I ate all the hot sauce and then chewed the gristle That's after. A fish shake, mate. Oh my, I can't do. See, that's like that. see, they know I I don't eat any fish. When we whenever we've gone abroad or any sort of restaurants for the shows, we go to a lot of sushi or takanadi places. Yeah, uh, two chicken katsu curries, please. Oh, and they're like, it's one of them, is it? And uh, that's that's all I have, <laughs> chicken katsu. Really? And they are on. Full on sushi. I can't. I can't. I don't really eat cod or anything like. That. I don't. I love catching fish. I don't eat it. Just. I don't eat shellfish. Fish are friends, not food. Yeah. <laughs> like, and that that uh, fish supper in the cup at Ictus. Oh. was hell. That was. But that's not like actual human edible food. Mate. That's not human grade. That's he, he went, he, Paul went to the supermarket. So basically, the challenges are they determine what swims we get. Yeah. So if there's three or four anglers, the challenges will determine who has first choice, second choice, third choice, and yeah. so on. And it started at Ictus, and it was the fish death cup. Sictus. <laughs> yeah, Sictus. That's, that's what it should have been called. And but Jay is a is a is a monster. He oh. will eat and drink anything. And that cup had. Smashed up octopus, herring. These are just fish that he's gone to the counter. I know. That they couldn't sell. These are all the overruns and all the odd pieces of shells and things. He put them all through the grinder. Tubes of wasabi, tubes of chilli. And I was sick three times live on camera. And I said, I'll take last choice. I just I had to. I couldn't do it. Oh, I wouldn't be doing that, man. And then I've stuck my head in uh, a full 10 litre bucket of Activate Activator. They burnt my eyes off. Like The pain in my eyes was unbearable. When we went jet skiing, for know, insurance would be good on these, wouldn't it, mate? Yeah, I, see, America, the challenge, the talk of the challenges for America were mental. Have you ever seen uh, Kings of Pain? No. Oh, is it? Yes, I think I have. Where they get like bees and scorpions, but they and who do can it take for, like, the sting? Science to see who can. Yeah, yeah and yeah. basically, uh, we was going to be no. uh, guinea pigs for, for testings of being stung and bitten. That was going to be one of the challenges. No, mate, it's not worth for a, that. For a choice of a swim, I think I think I'll have last choice, thanks. It's not worth that, mate. I'll take a paycheck if I'm one of those <laughs> boys doing it, but I'm not doing it for a swim. Yeah. yeah. What a chapter, though, mate. Like, And there's still more to come, but in terms of that whole sort of continental scene of fishing, I mean, pff, your broadened horizons are, are ridiculous. Yeah, there, that, it's they? been great, but what we are going to focus on now, though, as, as a brand is is UK fishing as well. We yeah. know like we are, a lot of our products are sort of continental, the bigger items, you know, people like the shelters there, everyone's buying them for going to mm. France and abroad. And uh, like we do solar panel, power packs, power lighting, all that cookware stuff. You can use it in the UK and we sell absolutely loads of it. But we're now going to be doing a uh, series solely fishing in the UK as well. Yeah. So we're not just going to be the great escapes abroad. Yeah, there's yeah, going yeah. to be series for the UK. So there's going to be something to help English anglers 
that are going into the tackle shops asking for advice, similar to what you lads do, like your socials at Bluebell and things yeah, like that. Yeah. We're going to be going down that route as well. So nice. we're catering to everyone. Yeah, good. Nice. So almost in a sort of random roundabout way back, you're obviously a Kent boy. We're going to look at some of the success that you've had locally over the years. Not too recently, because we're going to come on to that in a slightly later chapter. Yep. But there are a number of sort of standout venues that are local to Canterbury Lakes, yeah. your way. Yeah. And you've had a very, very impressive sort of background and history in terms of captures on them, haven't you? Yeah, it probably... It will go back to when I worked working at Fatfish Tackle. Very lucky back then. Uh, Mid-Kent Fisheries was the most well-known club around in that area. And Mid-Kent Fisheries, they patrolled Coninbrook, Swan, Tumford, Pan, Handel. Uh, they used to have Chill and Meal, Loggies and Stour. All that was one complex of lakes, which is quite phenomenal when you look at the brook, the fish that they've had. And they've also yeah. got other lakes at Lyd and Faversham. So it's a great ticket. And fortunately for working at the shop, I became very good friends with Chris Logston and his wife, Joe. They come to my wedding. Uh, still good friends with them now. And I've fished them waters ever since. And some of the fish that reside in them are just like, they're majestic, mate. Like uh, when I worked at Fatfish, the two that I really sort of done a bit of time on, well, three actually. I'd done a little bit of time on the swan, but it was loggies and chill and mill. Mm. Uh, fish loggies when I was at the shop. So this is going back quite a, quite a while now. What year are we talking here? <sighs> Getting in 10, 11 years, 10, 11 years ago. Really? Yeah. So okay. back back on loggies. Uh, and also close, to, very close to where I live, you've got Cottington as well. So yeah, uh, I would always do a little bit on there. And I actually had, when I fished Cottington many years ago, I had 39.5 mirror which was my PB for a while. And yeah, that was just on a quick day session with me mate Mark, who's actually the manager of Fatfish now. All them years ago, like we've been mates for years and we went over there, uh, 39.5 and an incredible capture. And that's actually now, that fish has gone £50 in that venue. Has it? So it's a, it's a really, really big sort after fish now. So yeah, it was, uh, it was quite nice. I've got I've gone back over Cottonton. I've had quite a few. I've never had a 40 from there. I've had multiple 37s, 38s. Going back fishing it, but I've never, I've never not had a forty. But my sort of time, where I really sort of cut my teeth and learned and developed was Chillum. Chillum was one of the first venues that obviously had a lot of press, BCAC, yeah, uh, real historic water that uh, Chris Logston and his dad had created there, and just an amazing place, like the ultimate cart fishing venue. When when you go through the gates, when all them years back go back then, it was just magic. But it was so hard to get a swim. Because you had all these people on all these different tickets, one corporate ticket bought all of those tickets so you could fish any of the waters. Right. But Conningbrook was for your Yeah, yeah. Your diehard campaign campaign, fish, yeah. One target fish, in search of two tone and some of the backup beauties that are in there, or that was in there. And everyone else would find himself down Chill and Mill. The it was like the Mecca in that area. Really weedy, really rich water with naturals, but some bloody big fish in there, like lovely ones, really nice for fish in there. And the big one in there is a fish called Chilies, but there's a lot of backup 30s. And like now the stock is ridiculous. I think there's like 16 over 40 yeah. pounds. It's ridiculous. Yeah. Vince, who's got it now because it's been purchased, he's, uh, he's off fence the whole place. So it's secure. They're all. Oh, it's, just, it's, yeah, it's, yeah. Like, it's a dream syndicate. It's a dream syndicate now with big, big, with big, big fish. Uh, when I was at Fatfish, I fished it with Andy, me and the owner, sort of rotate areas. And I had a spell in my angling locally that I oh, just it was just it was blew me away, mate. I was I do I do when I worked at the shop I did overnighters and it was usually a Tuesday or a Thursday. But I'd play football Saturday. Yeah. I'd play football Sunday in the morning and the afternoon. So Saturday morning I'd play football. Uh usually eleven eleven but it changed to one over a couple of years. It was usually eleven o'clock kickoff. Spend the set all day Saturday with the missus. Sunday morning I'd have football again. Yeah, and then uh, go to. Sorry, I got the wrong way around. Saturdays be afternoon, Sundays be morning, and then I'd spend the evening. But I'd bait up every Sunday evening, and I'd bait Chillum really heavy, really heavy. So Chillum, there used to be a book that uh, it'd tell you who was in what swim, and for the duration of their stay. Okay, and there was an area of the lake known as the dugouts, two, three, four, really popular swims now, and you probably hear why. They were really unfavoured. They one were lad, unfavoured. Really unfavoured. One lad on there, James, done really well down that end. And he was the only sort of lad fishing it. But they were great swims to pre-bait. 
because everyone was up in the middle part of the lake, 10, 11, 12, one pole tranny, one, one pole transformer, scaffolds, shooters bay, like real good areas, but you had to go past this end to get up to them areas. Mm. So what I would always do, I'd look at where the people are signed in, car parks, four swims down if I was in peg four, and you know that you're going to get a chance to bait up and no one's going to see you do it. Yeah. And I used to bait it hard. That was the first real time where I realised bait was an edge. Working at the shop, I'd listened to some very good anglers and it hasn't got to be bait in quantity. No. Quality bait at the right time and the right application will bring you bites over filling it in as such. From listening to good anglers, like good Kent anglers that have achieved monumental success on all these lakes. So I was a sponge. My ears were listening to when they were talking. And so I took this into my fishing and I'd bait Sunday, fish Tuesday, I'd bait Thursday, I'd bait Sunday. And then when I fished them Tuesdays, mate, honestly, I'd done 10 nights. In a 10-night period, I had 13 fish over 35 pounds and the biggest fish in the lake, Chili's at 45, 14. Oh, my days. But from listening to what certain people said, and madly as well, that, that lake's bait boats and everyone fishes range. Yeah. I was catching them in a gully between, it was anywhere between eight and 11 wraps, depending on where the weed would grow. That was good. Remix. He's had one, <laughs> he's had one dark fruit and he's gone, mate. Dark fruit, Dan's gone. <laughs> I would uh, determine where I'd place my rigs, depending on the, where the weed was. Depends on how far in this gully the weed was taken up. Right. So I've got good line lay, really nice drops. And this spot was just producing and producing and producing. And I weren't filling it in. I was just putting in bait consistently. But then when I was leaving, I, I can, I, I've got a winter ticket on there. It's probably don't hinder it. When I was leaving, <laughs> I would uh, change. If I was in four, I'd put a one, so that'd be 14. So no one would go back in there. So I was getting something going. And me and Andy, right, me, right, me and Andy right. was getting areas going. But the fish that rocked up on me, I had like the pretty one at 38. Bruce's fish, which is dead now, 38. Uh, mini chilies, 36. Like big, big fish of the lake, five belly common. Real big, big known characters like There's a theme as well of you sort of doing your own thing to an extent, isn't there? Little edges and getting your little edges. Yeah. We've talked about towing into no man's land, etc. But this legitimate little cheeky one on yeah. there. But also that, that that's, that's playing to your strengths with regards yeah. to fishing shorter. Yeah, fishing much shorter than everybody yeah. else. And it wasn't the fact of, like, I could have gone longer anywhere up to, like in that swim there, I think you get up to 16 or 17 wraps, mate, uh, at the very most. But the fish, they gave themselves away. Mm. So on one of the very first journeys walking around and your eyes are everything. It, it doesn't matter how long you've been fishing, your eyes are everything. They're paramount to what your success is going to be. And I turned up and then... You could see when you put polar eyes on, just a strip glowing. Without glasses, you didn't see it. It was just a, a, a glowing area, you know, like that's a route way, that's a passageway that these fish are using. Weed before it, weed after it. Oh, that's a no brainer. It's got, it's got to be, it's got to be an area. Got up to peg four and five, had a little look. Thought, that's actually a really, really good area, that is. And uh, went down there, led out too far in the weed, bit short in the weed crack really lovely gully that they are using as a travel route a pass by and they're confident because they're there I'm seeing them come down next trip to have a walk round because I didn't put any bait out as yet I just had a little lead around come down saw them showed <laughs> plumes are fizzing the first trip after I baited I baited Thursday Sunday fished a Tuesday the very first trip I had three and it was just I knew I was going to get a bite and I had to get the rods in it was a case of they were there eating the bait that I put in mm. I had to let the fish push out before I could put any rods in. I let the fizzing all go, put the rods in. That's torture. Bit of, oh, it's horrid. You, you're there waiting. and like I've done it in other lakes, like the, the stour. I've seen them in the margin, rushing to get a rig in, they're gone. So I let them push away, put the rod out, bit of bait over the top, not loads because I've been pre-baiting with like chops and whole boilies, just a little scattering to keep them interested. Same scent, same flavour attractor. I use a lot of liquids in my bait, mm -hmm. even now. What sort of liquids? Uh, hemp oils yeah but I use a lot of like now I use a lot of smart liquid and I, I was at the time using cell stick mix liquid but what I was doing is there's a mainline doing multi-stim which is like a feed feed, yeah. feed enhancer and I always think that that's like when I open a pack of salt and vinegar crisps my mouth starts to salivate I want to eat those crisps I'm sure that this is like a stimulant 
And I know other brands have got certain things, but this this is like a feed feed in a trigger that makes them fish want to feed. And I'll put a few caps into all my liquids, whatever liquid I make. So I'll get a bottle of hemp oil. I'll put a ratio of like six caps of this multi-stim. And it might be doing nothing, Hassan. But in here, to me, it's, yes, doing, it's, confidence, it's, isn't it? it's doing something. Yeah, of course it is. And I, and I do this liquid. And whether I'm using hemp oil, cell sick mix liquid, smart liquid, I've got multi-stim in there. Yeah. And I'll put it in, 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 in and it just, it just works for me. And it's worked from all the way back to fat fish yeah. to now. Don't change it. Yeah. To now. So I'd let these fish push out. And I was having such a good run of fish down there. And that was where I sort of really got to grips with weed fishing without mm-hmm. a boat because you weren't allowed a boat. You're not allowed a boat on Chillum. They get weeded. You've got to like, put a rod down and you've got to keep them on a the tight. And put a, I, I really got to grips because Chillum gets very weedy. It goes, that whole Stour Valley goes in cycles where you have one year where it's really bad with weed. Next year it sort of deteriorates. Then there'll be none. Then there'll yeah, be a little bit and then there'll be it. loads. Like, all lakes have cycles. Yeah. And Chillum was one of those venues where there were so many big fish in there. You can only ever catch what's in them lakes as well. So when I people say to me, oh, you've had a lot of big fish, you, you can only catch what's in that lake. If, if you want to catch a 40 and there's not a 40 in the lake, you're fishing the wrong lake. Yeah, but you're fortunate in terms very, of Kent very, and Essex, historically as well, Kent, the two areas where... I, I, I genuinely have never travelled to fish yeah. far, ever, yeah. because I haven't had to. On my doorstep, I'm in a very privileged position. There is some of the best lakes fished by some very well-known anglers, yeah. some also amazing anglers that aren't in the public eye yeah. that you would learn loads off, and I have learned loads off. And... uh yeah, Chillum was one of those venues where everything went right at the right time. Uh, I, I, so the, the day I actually caught chilies was I fished the 29th of July and I'd had six to six to the pretty one. at I think it was six to the pretty one at 38 or Bruce's to 38. And Andy at the shop was going to come down and take over me. He couldn't come down and he went like, because I always have my birthday off at the shop, 31st of July of my birthday. And... I spoke to the missus and went, I'm on them. I like, there's, there ain't many things I ask for in life. I'm on them. I, I don't, I, I don't want to go. I don't want to go. Yeah. I said, I've got a chance here. I'm telling you that there's, I've had a 38. There's two fish in there, good forties. And I've seen one of them like an hour ago down in peg one in the snags. I've seen it down this end. I don't want to leave them. Like, oh, of course you can. Yes. Yeah, your birthday, like on the 31st. So I stayed, I done another night, got Andy's permission. He covered me at the shop. And that next morning, five o'clock in the morning, lo and behold, Andy's come down, do photos for me. New PB, smash the old, 45, 14. Oldest carp, one of the oldest ones in there. Mm. Real Kent, old gem. Chili's fish. Chili, yeah. And uh, yeah, great moment with my boss at the time. Give me the, oh, I shouldn't have been there. But sometimes that always happens. When you shouldn't be at a place, it happens, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're like luck's on your side. Someone's looking down on you. Yeah. And I just think that the way that I had baited that swim over the space of eight weeks, it was 10 weeks. I'd done two weeks baiting with no lines in there. Mm. And then I'd done eight, 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 I'd done eight weeks of fishing, 10 nights, and it was colossal. 35, 36, 38, 38, 45, 14. And, but now there's some seriously big fish in there. Mm. So I'd, I was always, I really, really got my head into there. And then started just to have a little dabble around. When I caught chilies, I just had a little bit of a dabble around uh, on the other lakes in the valley Loggies uh, went to a day ticket lake. Yeah. So that's run by Frankie, top lad, real great lake. They've done really well in there. Got rid of loads of silvers. Uh, you've got railway track down the middle, Loggies one side, stay with the other. I've done a little bit, a couple of nights on Loggies, caught a few good ones. Uh, and then hadn't really been back to Loggies. I came, I had a few fish, I think to about 35 pounds on the long commons in there. Then I went down to, spent a little bit of time on Swan and Tumford. And that's a really sought after ticket. Mm. You'll see from like if you, anyone reads Ozzy's book and sees yeah. Kent fish pictures, it's got three fully scaled. Two of them are over forty pound, and they are armor plated, copper mahogany color. Like, Fully's a mega, but there's not many that. Big. There's not many that. And when there's two f- potential forties in one venue, and then Swan next to it has got one of Kent's oldest carp in the Rasta. Right, old, crusty, bream looking, withered fins. Uh, pinprick scales like that little that little complex of lakes there has got everything it's got they got character they got age yeah they've got one's granite like 30 fish in there five acres you're lucky if you get a few a good, a good person has an half decent seasons 10 fish yeah it's hard lake and then uh, the swan is just I get entrapped in the swan because it's just such a lovely place to be like Tumford's called the punishment pit 
It's a tricky little the pond. Punishment pit. What a name. You're competing against other anglers more than the fish. Yeah. Bum steer central. Like, I love I love everyone down there. Made friends down there and also made enemies, unfortunately. Mm. Well, how bad enemies? Uh, enemies because they didn't like the adver- the brand advertising and publicity. Like, pub- public- venue, publicity yeah, yeah. Side of it. And I understand that's opinions. Uh, but uh, hopefully them they're, they're not enemies anymore and we're friends again now. But uh, understand it's my job. It's like if someone's a painter or a decorator or uh, a carpenter, they advertise their work on Facebook and I advertise mine. It's like... Yeah, it's yeah. like it's part and parcel of the industry that I work in. Yeah, so yeah, but I, uh, hopefully they're all sorted. But yeah, a, f- a few clashes down there, unfortunately, as you do on some lakes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and on the Swan, my very first night when I was at Fatfish working there, very first night on the Swan, I'd well, I'd done twenty four hours. I had thirteen tench. I remember it like anything. Thirteen tench. thirteen tench, and it was br- it was brilliant as well because two people was on there, and one of them said to me, "Oh, the fish are all down here. You don't want to go out there, Dan." And they know me from the shop. I'm like, you don't want to go in there, mate. And i done really well on Chillum. And then I was going on to another venue, like flicking between the two. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, very first night, 13 tench, and then the Rasta. The one, <laughs> the one, the one, the one, the one, the one, the one I went on there for. Job done. It was over before it even started. Yeah. Unfortunately, uh, yeah, I caught it. 35, 14, weight irrelevant. Yeah, exactly. Just a, a relic. It was like an old relic, like, Real, real character that has just gone against time. Prehistoric looking fish. Mm. Pucker fish. And yeah, uh, the one I set out to catch most for that season, caught it on my first night. That's crazy. That so it was sort touch. of over before it game began. Same, similar tactics all around here for you? My baiting application and approach yeah. doesn't change in any venue I was going to say, it seems pretty set. It doesn't change in any venue I go to. I use a lot of liquids. Mm. I use a lot of crushed. I use a lot of chopped and a lot of whole boily. Some lakes you're allowed particle, so I will introduce particle at certain times of the year with a lot of salt in. Post spawning or pre spawning? I like matter? to do it all the way through. Okay. But but uh I like to I, I do use a bit of salt as well. Yeah. I'm not gonna like a few good people have helped me out and right times there's a, a good couple of week window. February I, I've done really well February to March introducing salt. Second week of February through to March. Done really well introducing salt. Uh not in large, large quantities. No. Just in like, sort of golf ball, yeah, a little bit less, and then loads of grinded salt in my particle or broken boilie. Yeah, salt and broken boilie. I touch on it with a stour. Transformed, yeah. transformed this last year's fishing, but even all the way back then, like then to now, my baiting application don't, same, don't, don't change. I. Why break? What's why? Why change? Yeah, exactly. Why change, I'm, I'm of that school. Why change before. what's fixed? Yeah, I go to lakes of fish for a bite. I do use a lot of bait. I'm in a very, very privileged position with mainline, uh, and I thank them for it every week. But I will only put bait in if the fish are telling me to put more bait in. Mm. I ain't someone who just turns up, rocks up, loads of bait, buckets everywhere. I take hardly any gear when I go fishing. Last thing I do is take five buckets full of bait. I like to, because I don't get much time. Yeah, my time is walking and pre-baiting. Done it at Chillum, paid off. Done it at the Swan, paid off. All the venues, I try and do it discreetly. Some people always see you. And if they see you, they see you. You can't get back in your spot. Hard luck. And then with Tumford, there was a period, uh, I was with Ridge Monkey at the time, but I'd done a little bit of time on Tumford. Because when I caught the Rasta, I was like, my head had gone a bit. I was just like plotting between different lakes. I was going to Cottonton. I was going back to Loggies. I was on the Swan. Little day on Tumford here and there. Night on Tumford. Tumford's hard. Mm-hmm. Tumford's a punishment pit. It really gets under your skin. Like, and I and I I do like bites. So it's the case of do I drop onto the punishment pit? Mate, he's run me up. I've had six out of the swan. Do I go and just get some bites on yeah. the swan? Yeah. And, I know. and you're involved with a brand now. So you need fish. You're involved with like by then I'd had like Rod's Rod consultancy, Rod sponsorship, bait spot consultancy. Yeah. And they don't want they don't demand, but you want to be loyal. Yeah, of course. Uh so I had a little flick about, but then uh, I've gone back onto the Swan and Tumford quite hard since I've worked for Ridge Monkey mm. and I've had some amazing fish out uh, in March. Like the Swan don't really give up many fish through the winter, but I did a lot of shows January to March, not last year, the year before, and I've done a lot of pre-baiting. So every time I came back from the shows, I was going down and pre-baiting one swim on the lake, yeah. all crushed cell, like, and I mean loads, loads of crushed sloppy cell, loads of liquid, so, and loads of... Uh, 
like sort of mulched down in water. Yeah. So it's really sloppy, just loads of attraction and a lot of multi stim. So like my favourite, that's my favourite additive. I use a lot of that. And I had a brace, the, the, a, a brace of 35 plus commons, second week of March. My mates was on Tumford, Darren, he came up and he was like, mate, I said, mate, I've got one. So I sorted it out, left it in the net, put the rod back out. Got like a drop, drop. I hit a fish on the way. Yeah, I hit yeah, a fish yeah. on the way down. And I thought that ain't landed right. Reeled it in really quick. Got the rod back out as quick as I could. Before I put the bobbin on, that rod's gone. Basically in my hands. Another thirty-five pounder. This one was a fish called. Well, I think it's changed now. Someone called it a tarmac common the other day, but everyone that knows it is called the one. It's the one everyone wants. They got mm. the raster and then the one. And yeah, I had it in March, like freezing cold conditions. Beautiful mahogany, yeah. like March colours. Yeah, right. it's like amazing capture. Uh, yeah, and so I just basically, I, I, I'm, apart from this last year, I've been a bit of a flicker because I've had lots of venues yeah, and I've done loads of filming. I've been away abroad. It's really hard to get your head stuck into one. COVID actually helped me maintain yeah. one venue for English fishing because I was doing days in lock, like days only lockdown where I could actually fish and baiting and walking loads being a bailiff. Yeah. And then when the opportunity come for us to do nights, I'd done all the hard work baiting and smacked it. What? A, I mean, we'll come... The Stour, right? Yeah, I'll touch on that in a minute. Yeah, it's uh, mental. That's a ridiculous chapter, mate. Yeah, mental. So I'd, uh, I'd had chilies. I caught the rasta. Then I'd done a day... Like, this is just like going back on certain lakes. Yeah. So in loggies, I've done a little bit of time on loggies. A couple of years ago... No, no, about 18 months, 19 months ago, I went with Mark from Fatfish, the manager of Fatfish, just for a social on loggies. Started in peg one, I had two, moved up to peg nine uh, in early hours of the morning. The fish move around where it's weedy. They do come out of the weedy areas at, at night, go to the open water. Yeah, yeah. And then in the day when it's really hot and clammy, they move back the into weed. the wind, the shallower yeah. areas. So I was bouncing between these two swims, one and nine. Caught two fish out of each of them, so four fish. Same presentation in the weed as as, as not? Are you fishing holes in the weed or are you fishing directly See, in it? Uh, no, I fish, I, if I'm fishing in it, I fish naked chods in all my venues because Kent's relatively quite weedy a lot of lakes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I fish naked chods a lot. Okay. But if I'm fishing just off it, I fish my Slip D rotator presentation. Right. Uh, I use like foam parachutes, three pieces of foam in a PVA mesh, lick it in and the, the foam dissolves and three nuggets come up and the rig falls. Really simple, like licking and sticking. But licking and sticking, sometimes it don't dissolve. Come, sometimes it comes mm. off on the cast. This one, I'm fishing effectively every time. It's a little trick I do. I call parachutes. And everyone asks me about it, like PVA parachutes. It's quite a good little edge. So it's in a bag. So I get I get three three pieces of uh, yes. PVA foam. Yeah. Push them all in. Yeah. Push them down inside funnel web. Yeah. Push them down, tie it off, knot it. So then you've got the three pieces inside a mesh bag. I then nick my barb between all three. Okay. And if the lake's deeper, I put a second skin of PVA mesh, a third skin. Right, and then so on. So it's definitely it. not coming off on the cast. It's no. definitely set. It's holding it up every time. Yeah. So and in, and in weed or just fishing in and around weed or silt weed, it's it's another game changer. Nice. It really is a game changer. Like I've been there where you lick and stick, whack it out there. If the PVA is like yeah. sort of gone stiff or tacky, you really in a couple of hours, it's still there. It's still there. Yeah, yeah. Oh, you're like, This is I can't believe this. I've had fish over me. No wonder it ain't gone. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. I, I went on loggies for this trip and uh, had three fish in a session. All whackers, mate. 38 fish known as the canal fish, 41 common, my biggest day ticket common, uh, free swell, and uh, the big fully in the, the big fully scaled in that 38. So, in I'll, the weed, out the weed? But in, no, this is swim? fishing up to the side of a reed bed. So, I'd gone from start, I started at number one, yeah, in the day to, in, in the daytime, had a few fish, but there's a little weed bed to the left, and the fish, like the oxygen levels and stuff, I just always feel that the fish move out. So I moved back up to peg nine for the night, had two in there, then moved all the way back up to the reed bed. And then that next day, uh, I had a 36, a 38 and a 41, all day ticket fish, uh, same nice. tactics, a little bit of crumb, a little bit of chop, a little bit of liquid. That's a good hit, isn't it? What a, what yeah. a hit that is with that yeah, size it's a, of it's, it's, it's a good good little ratio. And then obviously I went back to do a bit of time on Tumford, the punishment pit. I did. I ended up doing uh, 12, I've done 12 nights down there. And had 10 fish, including one of the fullies. Wow. At 41 pound. Again, pre-baiting and priming your areas. Pre-baiting with crushed cell. The punishment pit is not a punishment pit for you, boy, is it? It is now, mate. It's been a ball breaker since. <laughs> Has it? Yeah, I've had uh, <laughs> I've had a few. I've, I've gone on and caught. Like, I had a repeat of one of the commons. I've had a repeat of two of the commons. One at 36, one at 35. Uh, well, the, the, now, uh, one of the commons I've had three times. The, the, the yeah. golden. 
Uh, I, I won the fully scales at 41, which is Ooh. the up front fully. That's why I, I went on there to catch a 40 pound fully. But I will just be going back, never say never, because there's another one in there. Yeah, I was going to say the other one. Yeah, the other one. I just always flickered and I've just always, I, I flickered on, sounds bad that I like jump between them all. I've never really given them any time or consistency. I've done it because of my lifestyle and my work and my family life. And I always go back to it. I like bites. If I'm having a four, four, if I'm having a four night, so I say I'll do like four overnight, that's a month's worth of angling for me. Mm. If I had a bite, I want a bite. Yeah, so I'm going to somewhere to get a bite. Just, just to try and keep in the loop, but I keep my ear in the ground. I speak to the bailiffs all the time, friends with everyone. But you can keep bait going in different areas and you've, all, you've got the luxury mate, of all, all being all, close. All these lakes are 10 minutes from my house. That's what I mean. That's... And I've always got bait in the van. I've got bait in the van now. Like literally I leave here, if I feel like I'll take the dog for a walk, I'll walk around any of the venues. Just slip on church, no more, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'd like to be a dream. Um, but yeah, yeah, uh, so, yeah, so all them little lakes and there's, you've got Pan and Handel, I haven't really fished them or Conningbrook. And they deserve credit as well. They're nice lakes. But the the way my last 18 months angling's gone, fishing one venue through the whole of this COVID period, and I've not flickered between venues, it's been like the best. Mm. The Stour was always a venue when it was mid-Kent Fisheries that I never had a good track record for whatever reason. I do nights on there. I, in fact... Uh, Alfie fished it a bit me and Alfie yeah, fished yeah. it and Alfie done really well on zigs and there was one trip where I caught one of the old real old girls years ago 36 something Alfie Wade and done the pictures with me when we both worked at Fatfish but that fish passed sadly but I'd always struggled on there and I don't I don't mind to tell people like you don't always catch no. and like I only get one night to go a week to go fishing and it looks like I catch a lot but that's because I put so much effort into pre-baiting like I know. I knew that I was going filming tomorrow with Dave. Yeah. So everything's prepared and done. I've done three lots of solid bags. I've done three new zigs at different depths. Mm. Just everything's prepared. So when I get there, I've got everything in my armory. Yeah. Just that's how I am. I'm quite a prepared person. Yeah, yeah. And time's precious. You can't waste I, it. I can't waste it. But these venues, locally, time would be a bloody big help because it would be a big help because. I'm leaving some mornings at six o'clock in the morning to get on the M25 to get going and I'm missing bite times. Mm. There's times where I can hang on, but my job is really important and I can't like let down people that have got appointments and like Ridge Munkadow, like a family, all the staff, they're pulling everyone's like a family. They give me a lot of leeway. They let me go fishing to promote products and to do my own thing, but you don't want to piss them off. You don't want to take, the, you don't want to take the piss. No. So I'll try and balance everything and the stour with, uh, the last, the last, the stour. What's the number you quoted, mate? That uh, the, so, so the stour. We talking about it. So the stour. I, I had a winter ticket two years ago. Yeah. And when it was mid Kent, I never done great. As I just said, I never done really well. And it's because I kept flickering about going between lakes. And if I wasn't getting a bite pretty quick, because you could get a bite in there quick, I'd go somewhere where I could get a bite. Mm. Whereas now, I just in love with the place. I, I, I love it. Why? Like, uh, it sort of trapped me. One, I'm working my way through some exceptional stock yeah. of colossal, beautiful old English carp and also Mark Harrison's new stockies from Chilston Fish Farm. Mm. So there is some real old, dark Kent gem fish in there. Black Mirror, like uh, the wood carving. You've got the half-wristed. The long, sorry, the long wristed, the scarred commons that have been in there through Mid Kent Fisheries when it was dug, then when it went to Loggies used to own it, so the, so Loggies Day Ticket used to own it, right. so it's gone through all of this. They lost some of the old stock, like they lost the Mad Mirror, the Half Lin, and some of them old original, beautifully looking historic Kent carp are still in there. Yeah, but with some powerhouse stockies, so you've got the best of both worlds. And like literally, yeah, I just, I, I devised a plan last year. My, my main sole goal was I wanted to catch the Black Mirror. It's the one that most members on there want. And it's the one that everyone talks about. So my main target was to, right, let's work through these, just go, let's try and go through the stock. If it comes early, like the Rasta, happy days. So I had a winter ticket and I had six fish in something like 12 nights, which isn't, 
which isn't too bad on a winter ticket. Right. And I didn't really know the lake and I'd struggled previously to mid Kent. This is like, that's like 18 months ago. Then it come to get a full ticket and then the owners of the lake, Mark Harrison and my good mate Keith, who I've become exceptional mates with since my time on the lake, they offered me the chance to be a bailiff because I live locally. Mm. I do a lot of people's fish pictures on there to help them. They've got, we've got items there, container and bits and pieces and anyone gets a fish tethered up because it's very weedy, can I get up there and help if I'm around? Of course I will. I'd love to be a bailiff, thank you very much. So I got made a bailiff and right from the word go, I just, uh, something changed. I I was messing about on there because it used to be very good for zigs. Yeah. So I'd always have a rod and zigs. Notoriously, it's very good on solid bags, two grains of plastic, but the tension ravenous in there. So I would always go there and try, bang, 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 three rods. I'm covering all eventualities. Let's work out what's working. And I might be able to devise a plan, what's working. I'll change all three rods to it. Wasn't going too great. I've uh, done a couple of blank sessions and then I realised they're bait fish. I believe them fishing that lake are bait fish and I don't think anyone's really done it for many, many years. I went up there and absolutely <laughs> larrups it, mate. What are we talking? How much were you putting out? Per pre-bait? Yeah. 25 to 35 kilos. Wow, yeah, yeah, that's some bait. Pellet and boily. Going out in a dinghy some occasions, 10 kilo bag of sale, 25 kilo sack of pellet. It's a lot of bait. Still the same sort of bait up twice a week and fish it on the Tuesday night? Baiting that every just once. Just once? Just once. Okay. Because now for Ridge Monkey, it was a bit different then because uh, now the brand's obviously evolved. Yeah. Our workload's evolved. Yeah. And I don't know when I'm going fishing Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, whatever overnight it could be. Yeah. And I don't fish Friday, Saturday, Sunday, so it gives me four days to try and find an overnight space. So pre-baiting... I like to pre-bait most times Sunday afternoon when everyone's gone home. Yeah. And it paid real dividends, mate. Like, to just I, I started off catching fish instantly over bait and it was over a lot of pellet and a lot of crumb boily. But you're talking 30 kilo bait, most pre-baiting sessions. And other people are going in with single solid bags. Yeah. For, it started off really well. A uh, couple of the old originals, none of the named originals, and then out of nowhere, I was fishing there called the Alien. The same session I caught the Alien, the Baby Black. And then I caught Alien, Baby Black, and another real nice chestnutty, sort of three-quarter fully scaled, so that I knew they're getting on bait. I'd outwitted, not the stockies, three of the originals, yeah, the- which are the ones everyone wants. Yeah. So I knew that bait was the key. Me and Keith speak a lot. We knew that bait, th- th- these are now bait fish. That, that, they've always been, because they eat bait. But a lot of people put out single bags or single zigs. Fuck that. I went balls <laughs> I went balls deep on, on on big sets of bait. Yeah. But fishing bags and slip D rotators over the top. And I've had so many like, this last year, the amount of fish over thirty five pounds on solid bags I've caught is just every unbelievable. Every week, mate. You said like literally every week. Uh, You're having a thirty. So last year I had, year to year. I, I caught the one I really wanted to and got front cover of Total Carp. I caught the Black Mirror. Yeah. I actually caught it twice. And it's a bit of a mad story because I, was, I caught it a £40 four and it just looked old, crinkled, majestic. Beautiful, yeah. Beautiful, like it should be sitting next to the Queen. It was like royalty. <laughs> this carp was royalty. Like it should be sitting next to the Queen. This, this fish was royalty. Yeah. And I did it. I caught the one that I set out to again. So I did it. But then... I did a big write-up in Total Carp, solid bag success for Matt at Total. And ridiculously, the day, the week before it was going to go, no, he messaged me a final proof and said, how is this? The day I got that proof set in, I caught it again. And they came down and done pictures for front cover. I would never usually retain yeah, fish, of course recaptures. Not, but, yeah. Because it was that fish that was for the main sole thing, I caught it again. Get the best shots you can. Caught it again. Weight difference, any? Uh, down in weight, spawned out 37, yeah, okay. 37.6, 37 pounds. Something. But a mint fish also. Yeah, twice, caught it twice. And then I went on to catch, over the last 12 months on that lake, doing certain tactics and bait application. Certain it, tactics? You're still on there, aren't you? I can't really say. Yeah, so yeah. so I'm, st- I'm still on there now. But as the year goes on, with photosynthesis, the rich water clarity, the weed is unbelievable. Yeah. Unbelievable. And you're literally going out in the boat, finding... Really nice clear areas, 
clayed up areas are the ones I'm looking for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. These patrol routes that I know they're using channels in the weed. These channels in the weed, they end up finding like your chair you've got over there. Yeah. Left. You find a glowing spot. So there's channels for all the weed, like an M25, like a spaghetti junction. And then out of nowhere, there's a big clayed up area. Boom. And I go out in the boat and I leave the oars, no outboard, just leave the oars, stand up. And I just watch and keep as calm as I can. Look where they are. One of the real big spots to success, I found an area that I'd found with a marker lead, went out to a boat, went out there in the boat, put a load of bait out, marker, marker float come up, 10 kilo sail, pellet everywhere, big scattering. But I used a lot of chops. Like, so I've probably done that 10 kilo sail, six, six and a half, seven kilos chops mm. because the weed all around it is like onion grassy, eel grassy. And I want them fish to come in and feel confident yeah. and then go to like the their residential home, that area that I know they love. They're waiting. They're eating all this food. It's like it's like you know when you uh, you get a Kent- you get a Kentucky or you get something from a drive through. As soon yeah. as you get that bag, you're in there grabbing bits, eating chips, yeah, and yeah, then yeah. you park up and eat it. That's the way I think of it. They're, like, they're coming through the drive through. I have a little half chop there in the weed. Yeah, I have another yeah. little half chop there. Oof, boom! Massive bloody bargain bucket for ten. I'm having that. That's what I do. I make the the, the way I bait. I don't bait really accurately. I bait when I go out in the boat, so they're confident in and around their zone. And then the area that I know they've been grubbing, yeah, that is really pronounced. The clay, they're all clay. The ones that you're seeing in there, they're like in a tornado going around this little residential area, <laughs> and they're all clayed up. And you know they're in there enjoying it, and they're in there for a reason, getting minerals, nutrients, and they feel safe. Mm. And that has done me so many fish, mate, like so many fish. And there's been times where someone's followed me in a swim. And fishing like near that area, but not on it, not on it, and they're not getting bites. And then when that is the case, I'm quite clever with the spots that I choose to pre bait. That if someone's in that swim, I can get the edge of it by the next swim. Oh, okay. Or certain areas that I bait, the, the lake narrows up. If someone's one side, it might look tight, but I've still given them the four or five wrap distance. You're getting it from I'm on the other side, and they're not getting bites. I am. And it's a. Uh, I'm, 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 because I've got limited time I spend a lot of time observing a lot of time walking mm. to make everything in my favour and year to year I had 87 takes on that lake I've had 87 takes I've lost three fish 84 fish landed I've had quite, wow. a, few, I've had quite a few repeat captures considering the weed you said as well only weed, three weed, fish the, lost yeah the weed, the, weed, the weed can get bad I'm not saying it's like top to bottom everywhere but if you look at my Instagram there's a lot of posts and you see the weed and I've actually shown some of these clay spots on my Instagram there it's like vortexes, but it's like a drive-through scenario. I bait up, so they, yeah. here's you, like you get a McDonald's and bef- like just natural instinct with hunger, you grab a couple of chips out before you've par- actually parked up to eat it. Yeah, and that's what I try and do with the bait. But it's not only that; like if you've got all the other anglers chucking a solid bag, you've got that concentrated parcel yeah. that is danger. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas this is nicely sort of spread it everywhere. I, I do try and do things different to my bait, like yeah. uh, with the liquid additives, the crushed. But they are and bait. the quantities in yeah, that sense. The quantities I've, I've done a lot of bait. I, I don't know how much bait I've done this last year. I, I couldn't tell you. <laughs> you catching on it, boy? I, I couldn't tell you. Uh, and then, so I caught really well right the way through the year. But January, this from January to January, it really started like January to March this year, where it was days only. Mm. I spent a lot of days walking on the phone for work, like working from the lake. Like me and Keith, the the head bailiff there, we just spent a lot of time there, walking, watching, devising plans away from each other, but the same tactics, the same eight bait application. I don't want to say too much because I believe it's a massive edge for what we've done. Uh, but what I learned through the course of January, February, and March from my time out in the boat and watching fish down in the weed, keeping warm the way they were moving and the way that I now learned about, like looked up about their metabolism, what they can eat, how much they've got to move to exert. And I've really looked into it because I was going out in the boat and these fish ain't far away from my baited area, but I weren't getting takes. And I was like, they ain't moving much. They haven't no. got to move. I don't have to, these don't have to move. And then I've done a slight tweak with some bait in the winter and it got me bites from January, February, March. And I've actually had a 30 pounder January. To, I've had a 30 plus every month from January to July so far. Yeah, that's epic, that is. Uh, I've had a 240 since February, no, 240 since March, the biggest fish in the lake. I had I had Guestley, which we thought was the biggest fish in the lake at the, previously. 
And then I've now had the big stock here at £44. A fish that got stocked, actually, £18 four and a half years ago by Mark, Chilston Fish Farm, is now £44.10. What a strain that is. And a, a habitat that in, is. Incredible fish, mate. Like, it's not just in that lake either. Uh, the lakes that I've seen Mark's fish go into from that Chilston Fish Farm, they are amazing. Dark, scaly, mm. big shoulders, and like, it ain't a no-brainer. you got to look at it that... Those fish, and to get the size when they're 18 pounds, what have they been fed on? Pellet. Yeah, of course. So what do I use loads of? Pellet. Pellet. And you can make your pellet so attractive. Mm. And a couple of people knew what I was doing in the winter. And it's a bit like against the grain for the winter. Like a lot of people use the naturals, the maggots. Yeah, yeah. I, I use loads of maggots. At one point, I had 20 gallon of maggot <laughs> because uh, I had a trip to Abbey Lakes yeah. And you're only allowed to use maggot in like handfuls there. And I had another trip after Abbey and it got cancelled. So I ended up putting all that bait in the stour and all the caught was eels. Didn't have a single carp on a maggot. Didn't have a single carp on a maggot. And I put nearly, it worked out, I put about 17. 17 gallon of maggot. Pellet the worm. Pellet, pellet, pellet. Is, pellet, is it... pellet and a few liquid additives and the boily. Nice. Good. Nice, ambiguous, vague. Respond. Is there anything left for you to catch in there? Yeah, there's a like. It's a bit. The, the, the lake's changing and evolving every week. Okay. So there's new forty pounders coming through now all the time. From October, there will be twelve forties, and this time in a year's time, we will all stick our neck out on the line. The management team of that lake, there'll be twenty, eighteen to twenty forties in that lake. Twenty. It, it is. It's becoming a real sort after ticket. Yeah. People all over England. Uh, you've got amazing lakes all around in a lot of the Dinton complexes. Yeah. This place is going to, the, the, the Stour in Canterbury is going to turn out to be a... Kent's Dinton. One of those, yeah, one of those sort of venues that, like now, one in three fish is over £30. Pound. Every, every Nearly one in every three fish is over £30. Pound. Yeah, that's mad. And you've got variety, you've got old originals, you've got new ones. The new ones pack on so much weight. What What, what I think a lot of it is, is... The members on there are fantastic. It's a very small syndicate. It's only 35 members with no rules. The only rule is no particle, no tigers. Okay. No nuts, no particle. Yeah. 35 man syndicate. You don't need bailiffs. Everyone on there is so, so down to the core. They love their ticket. They love the water. They respect the fish. Everyone helps each other out. Someone gets a fish weeded. Someone gets a fish they need a picture of. They help each other. It's how syndicate should be, how club should be. And I love being part of that. And I quite like being on the bailiff team. And... It's just a magical place to be. And I've got other targets. I've got new venues that I've got tickets for with some colossal fishing. <laughs> but the stour at the minute, there's, I haven't had, there's, there's, the, uh, there's, four, there's four really nice ones I would love. But when there's a stock of over 200 carp, four, to circle them four is hard. It's, tough. it's, it's doable. Because You'll have them in the next four weeks now, won't you? Or something. In one hit. The, the, crazy, the, 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 the crazy thing is, I went to Spain, Oriana. And I was gutted that I weren't going to be back at the lake for six yeah. weeks because I had my best winter ever. I'd done 15 days in the winter, had 17 fish, averaging 33 pound. Averaging 33 pound. Days only. And it was just ma- magic, mate. Like li- double takes in February over big beds of bait. That's like winter fishing on acid, isn't it? Yeah. That's mad. And there was other people on there. Like, this is what, there was other people on the venue not catching. Yeah. All the members was asking me and Keith, what are you two doing? They still think to this day now we're doing something. Something we're using something or we're not. It's finding those real clayed up areas, the presentation, the application. Mm. Yes, the bait's key. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The bait's key, the application, putting it in at the right time and also the rig presentation because that lake is very weedy and I see a lot of people on there pulling. I go around and help as many people as I can as a bailiff. Yeah, of course. There's a lot of people that really struggle. It's not a hard lake. I'm not saying it's an easy lake. It's quite an intermediate lake but the rewards are in there to be had and you fish well, f- angle properly, and you can have rewards. I, I've, I've had the best. Year. I've had m- my best year English fishing for I can't remember when, ever. That's but but so it's because I've had the mindset and I've stayed on one venue, and I really do put myself to. I want to catch like being around Dave. I told you earlier. I want to yeah. catch now the biggest that's in there, and I've now done that. So like Dave keeps saying, move on. But there's... I know where you're moving on to, mate. Our little uh, intro guest, mate, has caught the very fish that you're going to look yeah. out for. Yeah, there's a. Uh, I will. I will be going back to try and have one of the the, the four. Yeah, I, I'm gonna flick. I'm gonna flick about on the stour, 
because obviously Joe's just caught that one and I don't think it'll come out too soon no. just after. No. So credit to him because it's an incredible capture and very good young angler, so fair play to him. Uh, I haven't actually walked the lake yet, that lake in question. I'm going to have a little go for one of the other fullies in the yes. Punishment Pit, Tumford, yeah, yeah, yeah. which is an amazing lake. Great lads down there. Uh, but the bit, the big factor, when you've got the ticket and the opportunity to fish for such a large carp, like that common that Joe had, and tickets are very sought after, yeah. that will, that that's where I'm going to be spending most of my time. I'd be there if I had a ticket, mate. What a fish. Yeah, what that's place. where I'm going to be spending most of my time. And I don't doubt you'll have it. That'll be another cover for you. I hope so. And uh, yeah, I just, like I said earlier, fishing's part of me. I don't want to fish four or five days a week. It's not me. My my life is sales, family and the odd overnight hour. I think that like, it's just a release, you know? And I think if you put hard work, effort into anything, mm-hmm. you'll catch them. And I do, I do do that. I put a lot of hard work in before, during and after. And yeah, I look forward to new ventures. And hard work, period. New venues. Mate. I massively appreciate your time, Dan. And for a very honest and upfront podcast mate there's fish there's information about the industry there that has not been dispensed it's very very open and also there's some unbelievable fishing chapters mate and it's relatively fresh there's so much more to do yeah, so mate. i'll no doubt have you back on here at some stage with the tale of that massive common i hope so but before yeah. you go mate nash quick fire questions and i've tailored these okay. to you all right there's less of them but they're very dan hawks specific okay <laughs> no pressure. First one is generic though. UK fifty or foreign seventy? UK fifty, but UK sixty common. Yeah. I thought that was gonna come. <laughs> um if you could poach one angler from anywhere to join the Ridge Monkey team, who would you poach? I would like to pull it out there. Go on. That I would like the person I, I, it's hard with names because there's so many exceptional anglers yeah. with exceptional attributes from other brands. Yeah. I would like the person to come to us, the person who wants to come to us oh, most. So good, isn't he? Gift of the gab, it's right there. He's got out of like a cul-de-sac somehow. Good from you. Um, Never fish in the UK again or never fish abroad again? Never fish abroad. Because there's so many venues in the UK with so much history that I've never been to. And I've never really stepped outside Kent. So with what goes on, RK, Essex, Reading. Yeah, a lot to do yeah, at home. Lot, lots to do. Good answer. And it keeps her happy indoors. Nice. <laughs> um, who would you rather fight, Jay or Dave? Who could you take out of those two, mate? You have to fight one of them. If I had to fight one of them? Yeah. Dave. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Dave. Jay's a big old unit, isn't it? Yeah. But he's in good shape as well, Jay. Incredible now, isn't shape, it? mate. The guy is an absolute beast. He's he's, he's just like, such, he's, he's a lovely human being, Jay, and he is such a lovely, friendly person. Yeah, he seems like a decent. People are like, whoa, but you haven't got to be because he's just a genuinely lovely fella. But he he is a strong fella. He's as strong as an ox. Oh, and, mate. And, and now the shape he's in is incredible. He's like Eddie Hall. He's like cart fishing's Eddie Hall. Yeah, isn't I, like it? I like that. Fair play I to like him. That. He'll take that. He, he will. He I'll deserves it. it. He's done some graph there. Um, eat a carp or sit in a bath naked full of crayfish. What are you taking? Sit in a bath full of crayfish. Yeah, you're not an eater, are you? Not an eater of fish and I can't, I, I catch them, don't eat them, boy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. Um, if you had to listen to one type of music for the rest of your life, drum and bass or country and western? Drum and bass. Oh, here we go. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm a reggae man. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The Rasta. That's why you had the Rasta yeah. so quick, mate. Yeah. <laughs> Your reggae. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll bore him out of a bit of UB40. <laughs> um, Camo or Olive? Olive. Nice. My last question to you. Date night with the missus or hit the lake on the end of a brand new, fresh southwesterly and a big pressure drop? Date night with the missus because a pressure drop, big southwesterly, we be busy. I'll turn up on a Monday when everyone's gone. Nice. <laughs> Dan, you're an absolute legend, mate. Thank you so much. To all of you who've listened and watched, thank you so much. Please leave a review and subscribe. Dan, once again, mate, 
thank you so much for your time and I look forward to seeing more of your captures in the future mate thanks mate enjoy the ciders <laughs> <laughs> big love mate thanks mate